Here is the latest Higher Summits forecast brought to you by our friends at the Mount Washington Observatory. Weather above treeline in the White Mountains is often wildly different than at our trailheads. Before you hike, check the Higher Summits forecast at mountwashington.org. Weather observers working at the nonprofit Mount Washington Observatory write this elevation based forecast every morning and afternoon. Search and rescue teams, avalanche experts, and backcountry guides all rely on the Higher Summits forecast to anticipate weather conditions above treeline. You should too. Go to mountwashington.org or text forecast to 603 356 2137. And here's your forecast for Friday, August 16th and Saturday, August 17th. Friday in the clear under partly cloudy skies with a slight chance of afternoon showers. Hazy with a low to the mid 50s. Winds northwest at 10 to 25 miles per hour. Friday night. In and out of the clouds under mostly clear skies, trending towards mostly in the clouds with a slight chance of showers late overnight, again hazy, with a low to the mid-50s. Winds will be west shifting south at 5 to 20 miles an hour early and then 10 to 25 miles an hour late. And then finally Saturday, mostly in the clouds with a chance of morning showers, then mostly in the clear under cloudy skies late. Again, hazy. High in the mid-50s with winds south at 25 to 40 miles per hour. From the Woodpecker Studio in the great state of New Hampshire, welcome to the Sounds Like a Search and Rescue podcast, where we discuss all things related to hiking and search and rescue in the White Mountains of New Hampshire. Here are your hosts, Mike and Stump. All right, Stomp, we are live for episode 164. Are you are you ready? Yeah, I'm ready, man. 164. Let's do it. Yeah, yeah. You're in a like a sweatshirt, so I'm assuming it's not that not that hot up here. <laughs> yeah. It almost feels like we're getting an early fall. Uh, it's raining pretty good at the moment. As you know, the forecast for the weekend is pretty crappy. Um, Saturday's looking okay, but at the moment we're getting some nice rain, some thunderstorms. Welcome to the fall. Yeah, yeah. No hiking for me this weekend, so... Um, no? Uh, yeah. What's going on? Busy? Uh, yeah, we're just doing some some family stuff, so I am... Okay. ...going to the Woo Sox in Wista. Oh, excellent. Yeah. I'm excellent. hoping on getting out Saturday for a long hike. Maybe uh, a revisit to Algonquin or something like that. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's a nice one. That's always fun. You're always yeah. in that little hood of Waterville, so oh, it's totally. very good. Uh, is is Aurora joining us tonight, or we is she no. uh, she's in for programming? She's uh, getting defragmented at the moment, she's so she's uh, yeah, she's busy. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, I did get like I was looking through. <laughs> I got one. I got a complaint about Aurora, and I was like, you know what? I'm with you. I agree. Um, so I don't know one person said they didn't like Aurora. So I think we need to defrag her, and um, Jeez, that's tough. Maybe reboot her personality a little bit, and then uh, bring her back new and improved. So we'll work. <laughs> yeah. Hey, but it's still the first, the first hike bot ever. 
Yes, I mean, come on, that's yeah, cool. Yeah. So if people didn't listen to the last episode, we we um, we had a guest co-host named Aurora, who is a uh, a hiking chatbot that uh, is very polarizing. But we'll work on that. But anyway, welcome to episode one sixty four <laughs> of the Sounds Like a Search and Rescue podcast. This week we have a follow up uh, from episode one fifty four, where we covered. A March 1983 fatality on Mount Washington where 23-year-old Ken Hokinson lost his life and his hiking partner, Ali Keshkuli, was rescued. At the time that we covered the story, we used the details provided in the summer 1984 Appalachia Journal. The writer of that article was actually the person that was first on the scene that helped rescue Ali and had triaged Doug, uh, or triaged um, Ken when uh, he came on the scene. So his name is uh, Doug Teschner. So Doug uh, actually was told about our segment from a listener. Uh, they randomly ran into each other at the Highland Center, and then I made contact with him, and he was kind enough to do a follow-up interview with us. So we've got a segment that uh, we'll be we'll be um, going to shortly. So definitely stick around for this segment because Doug has a lot of interesting background on that particular event, and then we get into uh, a lot of details about what the White Mountains were like back back in those days. And Doug has a lot of background and experience. He's written a ton of articles for Appalachia Journals. So very interesting discussion. So I'm excited to share that. And then later in the show, uh, our friends Scott and Addie sit down to talk about the Loon Echo Land Trust, which is sort of in my neck of the woods where I like to hang out in Western Maine, the Lakes region. Um, so Loon Echo Land Trust is a nonprofit organization that conserves, protects, and maintains many of the trails and land in the Lakes region of Maine. So Scott and Addie are overseeing a trail race series that we talked about previously to help support the trust. So we'll talk to them about those races. We'll learn a little bit about Loon Echo hiking areas and uh, talk some trail running in the whites. All this, plus we've got discussion about falling waters reroute, um, powered hiking pants, and then we've mm. got recent hikes in Quincy Bogs, and then I was up on Middle Mountain in Conway. So I'm um, Mike. And I'm Stomp. Let's get started, y'all. Let's get started, Stomp, and let's, let's, let's hand it over to the hiking buddies for a safety tip. All right, let's do it. This is Ben Pease from Hiking Buddies. We are a 501c3 nonprofit committed to reducing avoidable tragedies through education, impactful projects, and fostering a community of support. You can find out more at hikingbuddies.org. We wanted to say thank you to those who have supported our mission, and most importantly, say thanks to those who speak up, who ask questions, and who are willing to provide guidance and assistance on the trails when needed. You embody what it means to be a hiking buddy. And now, for all my newer hikers out there, here's this episode's Hiking Buddies Quick Tip. Never leave any buddy behind alone. Keep people in buddy groups. Wherever possible, check on your hiking buddies. Wait at trail junctions, roads, summits, and huts. Choose a buddy to be the sweet buddy, the last buddy in the group, and want to be the turnback buddy in the event that one of your buddies needs to bail. Brought to you by Hiking Buddies. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Christina with White Mountain Endurance Coaching, and I wanted to let you know that not only do I coach endurance athletes, I also coach hikers and mountaineers. I have plenty of experience in the White Mountains and would love to teach you how to start out, whether you're a beginner, if you're more advanced, give you some more skills to transition from hiking to trail running, and most of all, teach you how to move safely in the mountains. So whatever your goals are, whatever your experience is, reach out, coaching.christinafolsick.com. I'd love to help you and we are back thank you hiking and buddies and back. thank you christina from white mountain endurance coaching thank you very much everybody good stuff huh 
Good stuff. Yes, stop. So uh, where do you want to start tonight? We've got a list of things, but we got to go quick because we we got to get yeah, to we, sure we got to get to the meat of the show. Yeah, we got a little bit of hiking drama going on. Somebody with the IG handle of Delete the Cog. I guess that's a, somewhat of a provocative name. I uh, posted a video of uh, some old trestles and ties up, uh, probably at the what uh, Burt Ravine level would you say, Mike? Around four thousand feet, four forty nine hundred feet. Yeah, it looks quite steep. It looks like an area that you don't want to be poking around in. Yeah, and uh, the person was. Um, accusing the cog apparently of uh, just making a mess up there with new you know just new trash and new you know uh, throwing ties everywhere onto the alpine garden and uh not sure if that was the case but that was the allegation and then um folks from the cog responded and put some context to it and apparently some of that damaged uh structure up there was due to the great hurricane of 1938 and, um, you know, there was discussion in the past about cleaning it up, but apparently it just wasn't feasible. It would have caused more destruction to the area, bringing up large equipment, et cetera, et cetera. But we have provided the link so you can make your own decision. Check yeah. it out. And I think that there's rules about, I have to look it up, but I feel like there's rules in wilderness sections about uh, artifacts that you're not supposed to touch after a certain amount of time. So it could be that they, they fall under that. Um, you know, it looks, it doesn't look great, but it's also like, I feel like the, my understanding is, is that they've cleaned up a lot of those areas. This particular area here looks like it's down into the ravine and doesn't really look like it's safe to navigate. And oh yeah, uh, there's a fair you're amount of vegetation in between. So yeah, it's probably better to leave it, but I don't know. Yeah, Smarter people look, than I look safe figure that out but yeah the car, again people like to bash the cog they like to bash the amc at the end of the day the more you dig into the history of the white mountains the more and the auto road and everything like that we've talked about this endlessly right, uh, right. you know there, there's a there's historical context to why these structures exist on the mountains there's benefits to them particularly when it comes to accessibility that people wouldn't otherwise be able to access the mountains uh and then there's uh, you know, there's the fact that the, these groups, and we talk about this time and time again, the COG steps up when they need search and rescue assistance. The AMC steps up when you need search and rescue assistance. The auto road makes themselves available for search and rescue. The people that work right. up on the summit will will come down and help with rescue. So it's like, take the good with the bad um, and make your own judgment. I mean, I, I'm a little bit biased, I think, at this point, but um, you know, we'll put the yeah. link in the show notes. People can check it out. Absolutely. Leave it at that. Slasher plays it neutral. Yes. We, yes. We wash we're, our hands we're like, of the drama. We're like Switzerland. So. Yes, we just present the drama. Yeah, that's yeah. all. I, we used, I feel like you used to be all about the drama stomp, but not anymore. <laughs> Does that mean we're getting old? <laughs> no, well, maybe we have Legionnaire's disease. Yes, Legionnaire's disease. So um, we've, talked, we've done a story on Legionnaire's disease before. Um, so this came out in USA Today, so it's getting national news. So five New Hampshire residents <laughs> developed Legionnaire's disease after Easy. an outbreak of the bacterial, so this is a bacterial, not a virus, um, Correct, infection yep. caused by exposure to contaminated water. So yep. um, Stump, do you know, like if you use like a Sawyer filter, does it, does it protect you from Legionnaire's disease because it's bacteria? I don't know. I'm not. I'm not a, a expert on soya. I don't really use them. Yeah. If anybody, any I, listeners know, I feel like there's one. It's like it, it. It doesn't protect from bacteria, or it doesn't protect from virus. One of those. So if a listener knows, just hit us up, and we'll do an update on this. But essentially, these five people developed the illness in June and July after being exposed to contaminated water droplets from a cooling tower behind the Riverwalk Resort in downtown Lincoln, New Hampshire. So they just want to put the warning out that anybody that had been near this cooling tower. Yeah. Uh, well, I think this has those. part of your answer because it's it's respiratory, so it leads to pneumonia. Yeah. Um, so a filter's not going to stop it, but if you're breathing it in, then yeah. Yeah. Um, what cracks me up about this story is they put like a gigantic circumference caution zone around the city and it was massive. Like it covered almost the entire downtown of uh, the town. It's pretty wild. I don't know what what's going on with it at the moment, but it was part of that new river run, um, river walk, excuse me, resort that they built, and the tower was used to provide water to that whole building. So 
I, I, it's probably cleaned up by now, but interesting story. Yeah, yeah. So um, be careful. Yeah, um, I learned about that stuff way back in PT school. Like to yeah. hear about it now is like, damn. Yeah, and then um, the the friendly the over over friendly beers in um, Lincoln Woods continue to um, make the news here. So this latest is our friend uh, John Huck, who listens to the show, <clears throat> sent over a CBS article that says that uh, there's beers in that Lincoln Woods area. They're no longer afraid of humans, and they've been trailing campers as they search for food in the White Mountains. So the Forest Service put out a statement that it's received reports nearly every day about food-conditioned bears that are interacting with hikers, campers, and their dogs um, around Lincoln. So right. they've become uh, habituated to humans and are following campers and begging for food. So my guess is probably, and I got a feeling like anybody that's listening to this show knows the deal, you don't feed them. But my guess is that like, you know, car campers and, and people that are just up here once a year or something like that are probably maybe inadvertently feeding some of these fellas and causing some issues. So um, they've yeah. been destroying tents, backpacks as they look for easy meals. As the thing about if you're in Lincoln Woods, like I know it's easy to sort of like, okay, let's drop our backpack and step off and do whatever you got to do if you if nature calls or whatever reason but i think you just be careful if you leave your backpack sitting around I, 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 there's bears in the woods yeah i hadn't, hadn't thought of that um but there's a lot of buzz about this bear out there at the moment yeah. just the other day we had the uh, the team picnic and stuff everybody was talking about it um but just to qualify it, it's not not just campers but hikers you know absolutely right great point about the backpacks yeah, yeah. I mean, Lincoln yeah. Woods, Bond Cliff, Franconia Brook, Lincoln Brook, Black Pond, uh, Liberty Springs, uh, 13 Falls, Tent Site, all that area there. He's coming up and down Osseo. <clears throat> you know, it's there's plenty of situations where you might drop a pack or, or whatever. You just got to be careful. That's right. All right, stop. So uh, next, oh, show note here. We got a reminder. Um, stop me if you heard this before, stop, but I'm traveling. Where are you going? Um, I got to go drop my kids off at school. So um, Ah, there you go. Yeah, tis the season. Yeah, yeah. We're empty nesting now. So my, my, yeah. my baby is going off to college. But that means that there's no show next week. So oh. hmm. we are uh, we're going to skip this week and then we'll be back. Oh, we're going to skip, skip next week and then we'll be back with the show on August 30th. Yes. Sounds good. Yep. Yeah, back to school, kids. Ooh, back to college. I saw all the uh, back to school aisles at the local stores recently. I'm like, eek, it still yeah, yeah. cringes me out when I see it. <laughs> yeah, I got I to gotta do that road trip down to North Carolina. Like, it's like, eh, it's like a 12 hour ride to get down there. And then you, yeah. you got to um, move them into their dorm room and put all their furniture together. It's fun times. Yep, good stuff. All right, um, so next up here, Stomp, there's been an update that uh, Falling Waters Trail, which is well known on this show because we talk about it quite frequently because it's a hot spot for rescues. Um, there is a plan to relocate about 5,100 feet of the Falling Waters Trail to a more sustainable grade and location along with construction of a new 1,900-foot spur trail to cloudland falls so i'm reading this and this to me looks like they're planning on bypassing cloudland falls which is the iconic you know when you think of falling waters essentially that's the iconic waterfall mm -hmm. so it sounds like they're going to reroute reroute away from that area probably avoiding that sort of steep climb to the left of cloudland falls and go to a better area but then they're going to add a loop trail that brings you out to cloudland falls so that you can you can still enjoy it. Is that is that what I'm reading here? The implementation date looks like it's uh, sometime in April of 2025, and it's just in the early uh, reconnaissance phases now. But that's great news. I, I think it's a great idea. That trail is a mess for that that mile stretch um, and dangerous. So having spurs out to those locations sounds like a really great alternative. Yeah, yeah. Even like the the last five years or so, like that. That section where you approach Cloudland Falls has just gotten more and more worn down, and it's just too steep and too slippery. I'm assuming that a fair amount of, you can manage it, but um, a fair amount of people probably, that's where they slip and fall and injure themselves. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yep. Okay, so more on that one. And then Stomp, we've got a patch update. So we, we sent out our shipment of oh, patches. Yeah, yeah. Are, we, are we good here? 
I think we're good, yeah, except for uh, I stiffed Nick. <laughs> I sent out his package and I had missed his patch inside the package. Oops. <laughs> oh, this is our this is um Shame. our friend Nick Sidler. Shame. That's right. Yeah, I'll he's also in now, but uh sorry Nick. Shame. Sorry about that, but I'm sure I'll be hiking Shame. with him at some point soon so Shame. I can uh, I can give him one too if we need to, but uh <laughs> very good. Are we, are we going to open up orders or we 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 do we run out yeah now? No, we've got about 100 left, but I figured I would just give it a rest instead of having them trickle in yeah. uh, and having people wait for, you know, in inordinate time waiting for their patch. We'll just do another bulk order again. It's just easier. Yeah, I think that we're going to start, like, do basically doing merch. Like, once every couple of months, we'll do a new merch thing, and then I'm going to do hats next stop. I'm going to do a bulk order of hats, and we'll sell those. Okay, that sounds great. Um, I, think, I think the Bonfire does hats. We should look into that, but... Uh, Sounds great. Yep. Um, All right, so this next update I have here is uh, back in September of 2021, there was a fatality on Baldface uh, Mountain. This is on South Baldface. This was a group trip from um, Lakes Region High School in Maine, and there was a group of, I don't know, 20 to 30 kids and a couple of chaperones. And they were hiking ball, the Salt Bald Face Mountain, and um, high school student, I don't know, seventeen year old kid, I think, had complained to the chaperones and indicated that they weren't feeling well. They didn't want to continue hiking. According to the family, he was pressured into continuing the hike. The the chaperones didn't uh, ensure that his he had water and. Yeah, according to the family, they didn't feel like this, the the chaperones took his safety seriously. He didn't end up dying uh, later in the hike, and uh, there was a lawsuit that was filed. Um, the lawsuit claimed that the the young man had died of heat stroke. That students and staff weren't properly trained or equipped for the overnight trip, and that uh, the students' access to water was um, was restricted. But um, according to this new story here, the judge has, uh, the family had sued the school district and I think two of the chaperones and the judge in the case cited a law that gives wide protections to schools and their employees and dismissed the lawsuit. So no word on whether or not they're going to appeal, but um, sad story all around. I mean, I feel bad for everybody in this story and I think the chaperones that were involved here having to live with this for the rest of their lives is, is a pretty serious punishment, but I understand the family looking for justice to ensure that something like this doesn't ever happen again but there's just no there's no way you, and no one's ever going to be a winner in this one that's right yep hopefully it wouldn't happen again i mean at the very least that's the whole idea with the justice system yes yep right. um okay stomp and then next up here we ha- we got a quick article sent to us from the daily mail so the daily mail's mixed bag some people call it a crappy rag and a lot of times i find that the daily mail actually is pretty good and they do dig in and get the real story so i'm i'm more positive on the daily mail than maybe some other people are but anyway this one here is an article that talks about gen z hikers are blamed for record number of avoidable call outs by mountain rescue teams as instagram obsessed hikers rush to dangerous <laughs> beauty spots for selfies Makes sense. So, yeah, so this is um, a story out of, um, where is this located? They call this Lakes District Search and Mountain Rescue Association has received 7% more 999 calls. So I think that's in uh, the UK with many coming from 18 to 30 year olds. And Mm -hmm. right. um, Volunteers from the search and rescue are blaming social media because they're saying that these pretty spots are going viral and inexperienced hikers are trying to tackle these peaks and they don't have the skills to climb. Yeah, I think you're right about it being England. I was curious if it matched up with some of your data that you've plucked over the years. Yeah, I looked up. Hard to say. Uh, no, I can. Oh, I can say it's not hard. Stop. Um, I think that it's <laughs> it's more correct than uh, incorrect at this point. So when I I pull this data and I'm pulling it up as I'm talking to you, Mister Stomp, and I have a couple of graphs mm-hmm. that I can share in the the notes. And what I do is um, I assess each case and I, I basically make a call to say whether or not the person was negligent or not negligent. And I think in cases where they don't have headlamps and they get caught outside, like that's an automatic negligent. Um, 
and then I have this graph that's broken down by age. And I would say for the the negligent, the biggest category by far in the last five years, there's been 70 cases of 20 to 29-year-olds where I have indicated that they had um, negligent calls on them. And then if you look at all every other category from 30 to 39, 40 to 49, so on, the 20 to 29 year olds have more negligent calls than the rest of the age categories combined. And that's New England, or is that? That's just New Hampshire. So New it Hampshire matches period. up. Yeah, so it matches up. The thing I will say is that um, I don't think that there's malice in a lot of these. I think it's more um, edu- lack of education, you know, not having a headlamp or. You know, you get some of those cases like the two young men that got caught up by the watcher in that area there that are just completely reckless. But, um, yeah, I think young people just like they... The other thing I've noticed about young people is that many of the, like, the group scenarios where you've got, like, seven people hiking and they went completely off trail and got lost... Um, like the, there was like one group that got lost near like the Rainbow Trail near Wildcat, and there was another group that went off trail in Shakur in really bad weather. What I found is that <clears throat> the deadly combination is young, large groups of young people hiking together in bad conditions. There's right. been probably like five or six incidents of groups of young people over the last five years that have gotten in trouble like that. Okay. Yeah, this article may be slightly weighted uh, pro- uh, this group being the problem because it's a popular place for younger adolescents, and in particular during Easter break, they climb this mountain, and they've had, like, in 2024, they've had 418 emergency calls, 22,000 hours of rescue time, and if you look at the pictures, there's hundreds, it's like a monadnock. There's, like, hundreds of kids on top of this peak. Uh, so that might impact the data there, but Interesting. Yeah. Who knows? Um, all right, Stomp. Um, why don't we skip the big trees? Because we can we can spend a little bit more time on that next episode. But um, yeah, just just mention it. That's all I wanted to do is mention that it's out there. Uh, NewHampshireBigTrees.org is a very cool site. It lists all the locations of the largest trees in New Hampshire. So check it out. It's a great great site. Yeah, and I want to go back to this stomp and see if we can get somebody from this site on here to to talk yeah. about it later. But I was looking through, I'll put this in the show notes. Uh, there's a map that you can link to that has a bunch of big trees. They, there's one, oh, yeah. there's an oak tree in Portsmouth that it was right. planted in 1776 that's like 90 feet tall that um, I, I want to go check out. So <laughs> That's amazing. Yeah, yeah super cool information. We all know that hiking a mountain can be hard at times. So here's a corny dad joke to help you get over it. But um bum. Uh, Hey, Stomp, do you like dad jokes? Oh, I love them. You do? Did you hear the story of the magic sandwich? No, I haven't. Well, never mind. It's just a bunch of baloney. Oh, (laughs) Classic. <laughs> oh boy. Okay. Are you ready for Slasher's Ear Review? Um, so next up here, Stomp, we've got a gear review. So, uh, I got, (laughs) this got sent to me by like five people. So, and it looks pretty cool. So it's Arcteric, which is. It's the price though. They're in apparel. I mean, even just without like this particular gear, like Arcteric is really expensive. And I, I probably mispronounce this too. So people are going to make fun of me, but they have a new, um, pair of pants that has an exoskeleton and we've talked about this before these are basically assisted hiking um exoskeleton so it's a a, like an electronic engine with or an electric engine with the ability to assist with leg movements and um arcteric has they're selling these they're called powered pants which could make hikers feel 30 pounds lighter and they're typical hiking pants but then on the outside they have like these it looks like carbon fiber with an engine around the knee that pivots so pretty cool yeah 
Oh, they are powered. Interesting. Yes. So they're like an e-bike, or so it's assisted motion. Correct. Yeah. Wow. So we're heading towards the Avatar robots. We are gradually. Mm-hmm. Very cool. Very cool. Yep. Iron Sounds Man. Sounds good to me. Yeah. Right. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Right. Um, and then next up, I wanted to give a shout out to Will Robinson. Do you know this guy? I've seen this guy's name around before. Um. It doesn't ring a bell. All right. So Will Robinson, he had posted on the 4,000 footer group that he established a new fastest known time for his north for the Northeast 115, and uh, he did this in 19 days, 15 hours, 43 minutes, and 10 seconds. So he, what he did is he did the Northeast 115, so all the 4,000 footers in the Northeast. And he was able to do them in just under 20 days. And um, it's a lot of hiking and a lot of driving. And he's got a lot of details on this post that I will share where um, he's got the breakdown of all of his days, what his strategy was. Uh, it's really helpful. He, I appreciate it. He gives basically the whole strategy for how to do this. So I thought it was pretty cool. Uh, and essentially, he's doing this self-supported uh, and driving to the trailhead. So he would chunk it up and... It looks like he started in Maine for his first. So he did Baxter and Hamlin, and then he made his way south to North Brother, Avery, Bigelow. So you can sort of see his strategy, which is pretty helpful. So I'll I'll include this in the show notes, and congratulations, Will. That's awesome. Yeah, congrats. What's the uh, fastest known time for the Deratissima? How long does that typically take? That I gotta take 48. a look. At, I feel like that's floating somewhere around like four and a half, five days at this point. But I gotta take a Is look. Is it? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I'll have to take a look. I'm not sure. All um, right. Yeah. All right. Stop. Uh, that was the time of the show where we do a sponsor. All right, and this is the final plug for 48 Peaks for the season. It was a great run for them this year. So use your passion for hiking to help end Alzheimer's. In one collective effort, 400-plus hikers will climb New Hampshire's 4,000-footers or create their own hiking challenge to advance the care, support, and research efforts of the Alzheimer's Association. Hike anytime this summer and help turn the White Mountains purple to end Alzheimer's. No fundraising minimums required, but you can unlock fun prizes as you fundraise. So visit alts.org right slash 48 peaks to learn more. Okay, stop. And while you were doing that, I was uh, looking up in the Google machine here the fastest known time for the Deratissima. Yeah. And I'm showing... Arlette did that too, right? I think she's should be in there somewhere. I think she's in there somewhere, but it looks like the standard Deratissima is three hour three days five hours and three minutes so okay Okay. that's that's the standard route which i can't remember what that looks like and then there's a self-powered which i think is carrying everything on your own and that is um will peterson in five days and then Andrew Drummond, our friend Andrew, he's got the supported Deratissimo. So, um, right. yeah, good times. All right. So that puts some context to that 115 finish, uh, how impressive that is. Yeah. I mean, you couldn't do that without um, without driving. But, yeah, it's it's pretty pretty impressive. Yeah, um, it's wild. All right. Stop now. Uh, you want to tell people how they can get their, their swag, their, their slasher yeah, swag? Yeah, let's do it. Yeah, we can uh, talk about the the hoodies because uh, it is the season. I'm wearing my sweatshirt tonight, uh, but you can get those really cool slasher hoodies up on the bonfire shop, and you just got to go to the Instagram link tree to find the link to it. Uh, check them out, and uh, we also take donations for the podcast. And if you're interested, you can go to the Buy Me a Coffee for Slasher, and we have a donation this week from Mike. I Devaya, and he spelt he he hyphenated his name so I could get it right for a change. <laughs> oh so we donated five, and uh, thanks for the the spell correction, Mike. <laughs> yeah, Mike, and if I Good had stuff. to say your name correctly a hundred times, I would get it wrong a hundred and one times. <laughs> but thank you for the coffee. 
<laughs> yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And uh, we have a, a sponsor here of CS Coffee. So the podcast is also sponsored by CS Coffee, makers of eco-friendly instant coffee. It's perfect for anyone who loves the outdoors as much as we do. Great for backpacking, day hiking, camping, and even at home. So learn more about CS Coffee and get in touch with them at csinstant.coffee or email them at info at csinstant.coffee. Very good, Stomp. Very good. Now, now, now is the part of the show where we talk about what beer we are drinking, if we are drinking a yeah. beer. I'm on my my Storm Along Cider Kick. I am so addicted to these uh, legendary dries. They're, they're like two grams of carbs and 6.5%. I mean, they're so delicious. And uh, you don't get that heavy heavy feeling after uh, like a big double IPA or something like that. So, And uh, I've looked into a whole bunch of other things that they make too. They make all kinds of great stuff. Blueberries and you name it. It's a company out of Mass. Okay. Uh, Lemonster to be at, uh, exact, I believe. Okay. Yeah, Lemonster Mass. Good for you, Mass. Love it. Very good. <laughs> yeah, I have um, I have not, uh, I didn't bring a beer tonight, Stomp. I drank a little bit too much oh. over the weekend. I was out in the boat and oh. um, I don't know, sometimes like just a little inside baseball for people that listen to this the show, we, this is like one of those episodes where like we'll, we'll, we'll splice in segments. So we actually aren't going to be recording that long, like maybe a little under an hour, but the, sh- the show will end up being like two hours. Uh, but I, whenever we do these show stomp, I always sort of like, I don't settle in. So sometimes I'll forget to bring a beer oh, yeah, because yeah. I'm like, all right, this is going to be a quick one. <laughs> so I forgot. So I apologize, but I, I will get yeah. back on the drinking next week. Um, now, stop. We're talking about recent hikes, so uh, I can go first. Sure. So uh, this weekend, uh, we had a boat weekend. So once a year, we rent a, a pontoon boat and we go out onto Brandy Pond in Naples. So Moose, La- Moose Landing Marina is the shout out I want to give because it's a great place, great place to rent a boat. And we get the whole family together. We had some family friends with us. Uh, so it was a fun day for uh, f- to get out. So we rented the boat. We went out to Brandy Pond and then we went through the Songo River locks, which rise you up from Brandy Pond and you can get into Sebago, poke around Sebago a little bit. And then we came back through the locks again and went over to Long Lake. So it's a nice day to, to be out there, but I didn't get to hike that much. But the day before I went and I did a run on, um, in North Conway. So I parked at Redstone right behind the Walmart. And then I did the real trail. I did about three miles on the road, two miles on the real trail. And then I went up and hiked up into the green Hills in, uh, middle mountain. So it's a pretty good hike. It's about eight miles total. So about two miles on the, the walking path, two miles on the trail, and then another two miles back on the trail, two miles on the walking path. So it was a good time. The Middle Mountain's got great views, not a lot of effort, so highly recommend. Yeah, nice videos. Yeah, good for you, man. It's great. And then what about yourself? Nothing much, really. I've just had the DJ thing with the cog and all that, and then, um, you know, Mrs. Stump and I got out to Quincy Bog again. We try to grab that if we're late after work and we just uh, have an hour to kill before the sun goes down. So that was really nice. Uh, Quincy Bog in uh, Plymouth, if anybody's interested. Super chewy air, like as as it, it is today as well. It's been like, it must be the wildfires somewhere, some, you know, burning away or something, but it's been smoky up here. Yeah, same here. The, the sunrises have been pretty, but yeah, it's definitely hazy. Yeah, I mean, I've snuck in a couple of Welch Dickies. And uh, just a side note about, you know the, the poo bags that people bring yes. for their dogs mm-hmm. to pick up the poo? top-notch job everybody you're doing great putting the poo in those bags but there's a second step to that if have if you haven't noticed it's called taking the poo bags out with you when you leave damn it yeah. i couldn't believe it i did uh, i did wd loop and there was like half a dozen bags of shit just laying on the trail like what are you people doing I take them out with you. Yeah, you know they'll tell you, oh, I'm, I'm, I just leave it there, and when I come back, I pick it up. But they don't. So yeah, right. Yeah. yeah. Oh yeah, I doubt it. But anyway, uh, uh, just a minor note. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I Crazy. listen. I've had situations on trail. I had a situation recently. Like I bring, I pack everything out. I just put it in a trash bag, and it's gone. So anyway, that's mm-hmm. my advice. That's my philosophy. Um, Oh, but, final note here. We did yeah. sneak in a, a float with uh, my daughter. She's back. 
she actually got a place in Keene. Got me working for Montessori there, which is super cool. Awesome. So she came up when we floated the Pemi. And I actually got my true punishment float from our story when I mistook Sully for Shrek or vice versa. Yep. So here it is. Ready? Ooh, it looks good. <laughs> Octopus. <laughs> <laughs> it's a goofy as hell yeah, or what? Yeah, that looks a, good. So what do you say? It's like a um it's a float, a but it has eight octopus arms sticking out of it. So Yeah, it's like a kraken or something. Yeah, the guy looks oh, you know, the guy looks he's a handsome jacked up guy. It looks like Casey a little bit, our friend Casey. <laughs> so I don't know, it's a pretty tacky looking float, I gotta say. Yeah, yeah. Hey, um before I forget, I actually have like a um a tip for listeners if you want to do something cool. In the in Naples, Maine, on the causeways, this is not far from North Conway in that area. If you want a fun night out, there's a um, a boat called the Songo River Queen, which mm-hmm. is a paddle boat. And we've been going over the causeway like every weekend. We go out there for you know drinks or pizza or whatever, and we watch the people. And every week, every night, every, like Saturday night, Friday night, the Songo River Queen goes out, and they have different theme nights. So it's like a lot of ladies that are dressed up like in 1980s clothes. A lot of neon clothes. They have an 80s theme night. They had a 70s theme night. They had a country night. So if you're looking for something fun to do when you're up up in like the Lakes region of Maine, the Songo River Queen. I'll, I'll put in a, a link to the show notes to check it out. But it looks like a fun night. They have a DJ. They blast music. Uh, and oh, well, everybody's partying a, and drinking. How big of a boat? Oh, they could probably fit three, 400 people on this thing. So it's like a Mount Washington? It's exactly Lithuania? like that. It's the exact same thing. Okay. It's a Mount Washington yeah. paddle boat. Got it, got it. Yeah. That's awesome. We've, we've been trying to get out to do that. It looks like so much fun. I mean. Let's go into the segment that I did with um, Douglas Teschner. So um, you remember talking about the the rescue in episode 154 from 1983. Yeah. We got in a lot of details. So if you're, if, right. you, if you didn't listen to episode 154, it may be worth it for you to go back and check out that segment. Uh, but I think that D- Doug covers a lot of the details pretty good. So f- Doug's a great guy, fascinating story. So let's move into that segment and then we'll come out. Stop. All right. Let's do it. Doodle it. Doodle it. <laughs> It's time for Slasher's Guest of the Week. Very cool. Very cool. All right, so um, we are here with um, Dr. Douglas Teschner. Is that, did I pronounce your last name correctly? That's right. That's yeah. right. I don't emphasize the doctor usually, but it is true. I do have a doctor of education. Hey, you, know, you, you made it. The dog is perfectly good. You, know, you don't need the doctor. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No problem. So, uh, D- Doug, thanks for joining us. So, um, for the listeners, just as a reminder, I had done a segment on a um, a fatality and then also a, a rescue on Mount Washington um, that went back to uh, March 24th, 1983, which is my birthday. Um, well, I'm 72, but March 24th is my birthday. And um, Doug was involved, I- intimately involved in that search. And he had also, the reason I was able to actually research it and get all the information is Doug was the person that had organized the article that was in the summer 1984 edition of Appalachia. And, um, you know, this we will go into the story in more detail, but essentially there was a fatality, a slip um, and a fall from Mount Washington down into the Alpine Garden area. And um, Doug had come upon um, the body of a young man that had passed away and then his hiking partner later on and had been involved in uh, the rescue operation to um, save this this young man who had survived and then also to work to uh, to get uh, the body of um, Ken Hokinson off of the mountain. So I definitely want to talk to you about that, Doug, and we can talk a little bit about how we got connected. Um, but I guess maybe just to start off with, um, if you could just introduce yourself and give a little bit of a brief background of your um, your 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 your, um, your 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 life and a little bit about your sort of hiking and, and climbing background. Sure. Well, I'm delighted to be here, and uh, and I was I was just delighted that you found this story. And I, I should also mention um, 
it's in one of the AMC books, No Limits But the Sky. It's sort of an orange and black cover. It was reprinted. Okay. So you don't have to find it. If you want the story, you don't have to go back to the 1984 Appalachia. You can find it a little more, yep. a little more modern uh, setting. Oh, I'm, I'm trying to remember how long ago that book was published. Um, but, uh, yeah, I grew up in uh, Westboro, Massachusetts. Okay. And um, my, when I was young, my, my parents sent me to summer camp. My parents weren't hikers. No, they didn't take me hiking. Yep. But at summer camp, I got the bug. Uh, and it was a YMCA uh, camp in, 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 based out of Worcester, Mass. And uh, I went to the White Mountains. And I was, at the, the, ironically, I was very nervous about going, moving up to these older kids who had, uh, who did these big mountain adventures. I'd been going to that camp since I was 10. And at 13, I, I was moving up with the kids that did these trips. And I was nervous about it. In fact, I told my parents I wanted to stay back with the younger kids. Yeah. And uh, when we got out to camp, my father sort of disappeared, and he came back, and he found me, and he said, Doug, you need to go with those older kids. And ironically, uh, my father was killed in a car accident the next year, but I was, I did write an Appalachia. I've been involved with AMC and the Appalachia Journal for many, many years, and I, I wrote a story called The Father's Last Gift about my father and how he, he convinced me to go. You never know what events in your life are going to shape your life. And uh, through that summer camp experience, it was so influential in, in my life. And uh, so when I started getting into hiking, uh, I didn't have any family members. And I found about the, one of my counselors told me about the Worcester, about the AMC and Worcester chapter. And, and that's uh, how I, I started going on hikes with them. We helped build them. I helped with the first trail up Hancock. North Hancock, you usually have to take a slide. I mean, this is going back to the 60s now. I mean, oh, I'm, wow. I'm getting kind of old. I'm, I'm 74 years old. I'm, I'm wow. still moving. I was up on Mount Washington yesterday, I'm proud to say. I, yeah, you, you I, said I, that. I, with, uh, I sort of have two roles right now with AMC. One is I'm on the journal committee, the Appalachian Journal of and uh, in the newest edition, I just wrote, I found out my, my wife and I had recently moved and I found out my neighbor was a world, a wildlife biologist, a renowned wildlife biologist named George Schaller. And I interviewed him and it's in the current issue of, it, of the Appalachia Journal. Uh, but I've also um, do, uh, I, I do hut naturalists. So I go up and give na- nature talks at the huts, which I enjoy doing because through, through my connections with Worcester Chapter and I was getting into hiking, I, I, and I did work in the huts three summers starting in 1968. I tell a joke at the huts. I say, I was working way back the year of the moon landing and Woodstock. And I asked people, what year was that? And, and I just did it the other night at Lake of the Clouds Hut. And people always seem to know that was 1969. Yeah. So that, that's how far back uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm trying to show in my age. So, so did yeah. you, when you were, you were doing the camp work with AMC, so you, you were basically able to connect with the, the camp connection and then working directly for AMC after you got a little bit older? Well, the camp was not directed with to AMC. The okay. camp just took me to the White Mountains. Oh, got it. And one of my counselors, and I said, I wanted to keep hiking, you know, or during the school year. And one of my counselors, a guy named Brian Fowler, uh, who's kind of well known for some of the work he did on studying the old man of the mountains. And the, if you see the diagrams of the fall, how the old man of the mountain fell in 2003, Brian is the one who did that work. Okay. But Brian had told, he told me about the Worcester AMC, and I made connections, started going on hikes with AMC. And uh, and then Brian himself would worked at, at, at the Lake of the Clouds Hut, and I went up to visit him, and I think it was 1967 when I was a, a camp counselor at that point. And I said, wow, this looks pretty good. And I, I, I eventually I managed to work in the huts. I, I worked two summers. I worked 1968 and 1970 at Zealand Falls, my favorite hut. And 1969, like I mentioned, I, yeah, the, Mizpah, the moon landing, I worked at Mizpah Hut. So that's how I uh, sort of got into hiking and got into the mountain, got the mountain buzz, I guess you would say. Yeah, yeah, and we're going to get into some of that stuff in the late '60s that you uh, you were involved in. But I think just to just to get the listeners up to speed, so essentially, like I I came to know about you based on the article in the summer '84 Appalachia, the story of the rescue from 1983. 
Um, so we did that segment, and then uh, you know we have a, a decent number of listeners, and you know lo and behold, like one of our listeners, a gentleman by the name of Christopher Healy, and t- you Doug, you have to fill me in because I, I was exchanging messages with Christopher, but maybe I missed part of the story. But my understanding is is that. You came into the Highland Center. Christopher was in there with with a crew of people, and um, you know somehow the the topic of the 1983 rescue came up. You start telling the story. Christopher's like, "Wait a minute! I literally just heard this story on the Slasher podcast, and he must have told you. Like, you, you must have been like, you know, wow! I can't believe anybody actually like would have remembered that.' Well, that's pretty much it, and it was a connection." I had uh, it, there was a guy named he was Chris was with a guy named Joe Massery who was the, who had been very active in the Worcester AMC. I hadn't seen Joe in years, but I have. He had, I was at Highland Center helping out with some training for some of these volunteer naturalists and volunteers for the AMC. Joe saw me, he recognized me, and we got talking. And I, I back in I think it was 2017, I had gone back to the Worcester AMC for their annual meeting and gave a talk and. I really emphasize how, how much they had shaped my life in being involved with that group when I was in high school. And, and so I said to Joe, well, I'd be happy to come down again. I've got another story I could tell you that I, they'd be very different, but I think would be interesting. And Chris was with him. In fact, Chris was, was part of the training to become a volunteer naturalist. I had never met him before. Yeah. And he recognized the story. And I, I have to say I was flabbergasted. He gave me the account. I listened to it. And I thought, wow, this guy Mike—he put a lot of effort into getting to know that story, and and uh, so that's how we connected. Yeah, yeah. So I, I uh, you know, it's a small world. I guess it's fate that we we came together, which is great. But I, I read the story. I mean, I, I my father-in-law has a place up in Brownfield, Maine, um, right on a little pond, and I sat in my hammock and read the story a couple times, and I was like, this is I, the. And we'll get into it, sort of like the that day in your life. I, my sense is that that. That's a very impactful day in your life, and we'll get into the details. But I just sort of I tried to put myself into your shoes to see, you know, okay, how would I react in this situation? And I have some questions for you for sure. But before we get into the incident in 1983, prior to that, in the late 60s, you had been involved in another rescue, and you talk about this in the story in Appalachia that this this incident. So there's an article in um, I think the 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 seventies somewhere in Appalachia, but it's called Accident and Rescue at Odell Gully. You were involved, and this was in Huntington Ravine. As an eighteen year old, you were part of a rescue team. So, can you just briefly talk about like what happened there? Well, you know, when I first started, um, my first time in, in nineteen sixty seven, after Brian Fowler told me about the huts. I had reached out, and I and actually that year I ended up, and when camp closed, I came up and I helped with what they call the closing crew. The huts used to close on Labor Day. I mean, it was a lot different. The mountains are a lot different back then than they oh, are yeah. today. And they shut, and Labor Day, we shut the huts down at every hut. Well, no, I guess Mispa stayed open until, uh, until uh, Columbus Day weekend. That was kind of a, but that was the only one. And I'd helped out on the closing crew, and then I sort of started taking interest next summer. I was a freshman at University of Massachusetts. I got involved with the outing club there, which is another story. But um, during my um, – I was really enamored with, it, with working for the AMC, and during my college breaks, I would, uh, I would come up and work room and board at Pinkham Notch. Uh, and, you know, just being part of it and being in the mountains to me was so spectacular. And that one particular incident happened where um, there was an avalanche up in the... Now, I was, I was, I was not a climber at that point. I, mean, I think the Worcester MC maybe I did a little, little basic rock climbing, but very little. And, there, and this, this accident unfolded. There was an avalanche up there. And... Um, um, and they, they, they had trouble getting these guys down. And in the middle of the night, they sent two climbers up there. And me and another guy were the backup. So we weren't doing the climbing, but we hiked in the dark with these he- big headlamps with these big battery packs up to the base of the Odell Gully, Gully in Huntington Ravine. And, and me and this other guy were sitting there waiting for them to come down. And the two guys went up, ice climbed up, and they got the victim. And they were, and, and the other guy who was with me ended up leaving. He got cold, and I was sitting there. And there was a somebody previously had brought up a uh, a uh, you know a rescue sled. 
that were sitting next to me, and, it, it, and we were up there in the middle of the night. But then the, the, the you know the uh, sun rose, and uh, all I looked up, and this, they were bringing, they were rappelling down with this uh, that, with the victim, and the guy said to me, "Bring that sled over here," and I took the sled. And I went over next to where he was coming down. I put an ice axe in the snow. My ice axe. I had an ice axe, even though if I didn't know what, maybe I didn't know how to use it, but I had one. <laughs> and in my ignorance, I wrapped the rope around this ice axe, but without a knot, thinking, oh, there'll be plenty of friction. And this sled just took off like a shot <laughs> down the mountain. And fortunately, it didn't hit anybody because there were other people coming up at that point. And fortunately, you know, some of the people coming up got it, brought it back up. <laughs> I mean, it didn't have any bearing on the rescue, as it turned out. But it, it was kind of mortifying that I was, uh, I had done that. And it, and it showed a level of inexperience. Um, and so th- th- when, I caught, when, I, when, the, when the incident happened in 83, that was 15 years later. And I had done a lot, <coughs> I had done a lot of things between 1968 and 83. I really... I uh, did a lot of rock climbing and ice climbing, and in, uh, when I graduated uh, from college at University of Massachusetts, I was in the Peace Corps in Morocco, and I, I spent time uh, on my vacations up in the high Atlas Mountains, and there was another Peace Corps volunteer who, who was from uh, Seattle area. He climbed in the Alps. He knew glaciers. And we actually uh, took a boat across to Spain and a train. We went to Chamonix, France, and we climbed Mont Blanc up the glacier, which was, uh, you know, wow. And then we did a traverse of uh, Monte Rosa, a mountain from Italy into Switzerland that I had cooked up that idea from Miriam Underhill's book. Uh, if you've ever seen that, it's uh, Give Me the Hills. Uh, we, we have barely had a map. It was pretty funny, but in retrospect. But, um, you know, after that, I started getting pretty serious about mountaineering, climbing. And I had done a lot of you know, pretty big mountains by, you know, by uh, really the late 70s. I, we were back in the Alps. I climbed the Matterhorn. I, in 76, we went to McKinley. <laughs> me, me and my friends organized a trip up to Mount McKinley. And and uh, I, had, I had climbed a number of mountains in Africa and Europe and all across North America. I had climbed the Tetons. And so, um, you know, I, I, I think I would say this, that, you know, the experience – uh, when, when, as I reflected on what happened in 83, I was looking back and saying, you know, this is the experience that I had, had gained. And so when, when the events happened in 83, I kind of knew what to do, which I obviously didn't know in 68. Yeah. Can, can like, you? It wasn't good. But uh, uh, so that I think I think that answers your question. Yeah. Yeah. And can you talk about like in the early 80s, can you describe for the listeners what was the search and rescue infrastructure yeah. at that time. I know I think Mountain Rescue Services was getting stood up right around that time with Rick Wilcox, but otherwise, what, what was it like for search and rescue? Well, you know, there was a lot less people in the mountains. You know, it, it's really started taking off in the 70s. But, um, for instance, that day that I was up, it was a midweek day in the in, on the 24th of March. I, I had seen one or two people the whole day up until I came on this accident. Um, you know, that would be very different today. I mean, there's so many more people in the mountains today. Also, yes, the Mountain Rescue Service was had, was getting organized, but you didn't have like the PEMI, you didn't have the big volunteer rescue group, groups like the PEMI. I'm not sure what year they started. Uh, and then another one up, the Androscoggin up in Gorham. Um, and there were a lot less rescues, I mean, because there were just a lot less people in the mountains. So, um, Ironically, though, um, there had been, uh, the year before, in 82, there had been a major incident where a, a rescuer, Albert Dow, had been yes. killed. Um, and it's funny, I was just up at the top of Mount Washington yesterday, and I went down to the Mount, the observatory, it has a little museum up there in the Summit Building, and, and they have a plaque in there for Albert Dow, and I was thinking about that because... Um, after, uh, I, don't know if it was, I don't know if it was a, a law change or whatever, but after Albert Dow died on, or trying to rescue, um, trying to think of the guy's names, they, they got over in the Great Gulf. He, yeah, Hugh Herr and Hugh his, Herr. his climbing Hugh partner. Herr is quite famous today for oh, the yeah. work he's done on, you know, he lost his legs and then he went on to become 
uh, you, you know, from frostbite. They were out there for multiple days. And before they were found over in the Great Gulf, they kind of got off and they headed up Mount Washington and got turned around and ended up down in the Great Gulf and were down there for days in deep snow until they were found. And Hugh, Hugh Herr uh, lost both of his legs. But then today he's an expert on prosthetics. I mean, he's, you can find a TED Talk by him. Yep. But in, during that search, one of the rescuers, Al McDowell, lost his life in an avalanche on a, a lion's head. And um, as a result of that, they decided that any any rescuers would get free medical attention if needed. And I think I was the first one to actually ten, take advantage of that because I had yeah. my I had a little bit of a frostbitten thumb uh, which we, when we get into the incident. And I stopped by the Littleton Hospital on my way home, and they took a look at look at it, and I didn't get a bail. Yeah, yeah, I remember you referenced that in the uh, in, in the story uh, about the fact that you know you've kind of somebody I think had mentioned and you or had given you the assurance that like hey you're going to be covered if anything happens so so that's good and then um as far as that um so before we get into the the details of the event the other thing is with with appalachia during the 70s were you continuing to write and you had the relationship with with the amc in appalachia yeah no i was writing by that point so when when the um you know after this rescue I, I said this would make a good story, and, and I, I ch- today I, I consider it. Um, I think I have more other. <laughs> sounds like I'm bragging, but I think I have more other more art- articles in Appalachia, the journal, than any other living person. At least major yeah. articles. I've been writing for them for many years, and. Um, I, I sent you one of the other ones uh, that I had written. Uh, you know, a lot of them aren't that easily accessible uh, online, although they're putting more of them now. Dartmouth is now um, is now a repository. There, there are some of the old, a lot of the old Appalachians now. They're, they're you know, they're, they're creating online editions. But um, um, I had been involved with that. So when this particular, uh, after this particular uh, incident happened. I thought, well, that would make a good story, and and I got a, a lot of the people, including the one guy we rescued, to actually write accounts. And I look back to this day of all the work that all the articles and things I've written for Appalachia. I consider that the best. I think it was the best to me. Well, of course, it was a good story, but I think it was the fact that I got so many voices in, involved, and I, I managed to. I sort of, you know, I was one of the voices, but I also sort of edited it together, so it was kind of, you know, logical and it, it read well. And you know, I knew we were doing this interview today, so I went and read it again last night. And uh, you know, there's a few details in there that that. Uh, oh yeah, I forgot about that and. But, it, you know, it came out really well, and I was, I'm very proud of that article because I think it's a good story. Yeah, I mean, you, I mean, you, you know from a, from a, uh, a reader's perspective, like, it, it, it gets your hooks in, like, literally the first couple of sentences, and, like, it's just you're not putting that one down. So you, you, you whatever the mix is to get the reader to stay, you, you found it in that, that story. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah. So for the listeners, um, and I think I'll likely – um, replay the segment ahead of our discussion, so hopefully people have l- l- listened to the, uh, the the detailed summary. But essentially, you've got two friends, uh, Ken Hokinson and his friend Ali. These were both students at the UMaine, and um, had, you know, relatively new friends. They had had some success hiking up at Baxter. They had done the K- Katahdin in the winter, so they felt sort of confident that, like you know, the next level here is let's go out and do a, uh, a late winter. Um, hike on Mount Washington. They had grand plans. You know, we all have grand plans, Doug, and, you know, the mountain doesn't care what our plans are. So they run into, you know, some not great weather. That period there, apparently there was like a, a warming and then a freezing rain, and it just created like a really icy um, effect on the summit. And you you yourself had kind of gone back and forth on which day you were going to go climbing. So you had plans to climb up in Huntington, Ali and Ken were over on Lakes of the Clouds hot and uh, trying to decide. They were on like a four or five day overnight. They're trying to decide what their plan is. They ultimately decided to cut their, their hike short and go back to Pinkham Notch. The, they decided that they were going to go for the summit of Mount Washington that day. They did get a little bit of uh, a view when they got to the summit. 
at the same time there there on the summit, you're climbing up from Huntington. Now you had gone back and forth about weather decisions prior to that as well. Can, can you talk a little bit about like what's the resources? Like you can't go online and just find out the weather report. So what, what are you doing back in like 1983 to figure out what what day is your go day? <laughs> That's a great question. Yeah. I was I was thinking about the wind. I was more concerned about the wind. Okay. Um, but I think the key, and it was a key part of this event, is they had um, they had rain and then a freeze up, and so the summit of Mount Washington was a sheet of ice. I mean, now I was going ice climbing in Huntington Ravine, uh, so I was looking for ice. So that didn't necessarily bother me, although even coming up, there was a point where I thought, oh, I should have stopped and put my crampons on earlier than I did. So I was aware of it, but I was a little more focused on the wind. And usually when we climb up in Huntington Ravine, we didn't go up to the summit. You would climb up to the top of the ravine and you would hike over, uh, hike across the Alpine Garden Trail and down Lion's Head. That was sort of the traditional way to do it. Yeah. Uh, we were that fixated on the summit. So um, I had actually never done a solo climb up there. Uh, my friend couldn't go with me. And, I, and, I, and you know, some of the gullies are, are pretty straightforward by with modern equipment. Even, even then, the equipment had really uh, revolutionized in the 70s. Uh, with ice climbing, you know, it was a lot easier to, there, there was the, the, the rigid crampons and the, the shorter uh, ice axes and whatnot. In the, in, in the 60s, when I first did ice climbing with the Worcester MC, you had to chop steps. Um, but that really changed. It really, Yvonne Chouinard really revolutionized uh, ice climbing. When I really got serious about ice climbing, we were already had this front pointing and these some of these other tools and uh, so to climb up what was the central gully, which is not the same one that I had been involved with. In I had climbed up there multiple times with ropes, with partners. Um, so I was very familiar with the mountain. And, and that had all happened since 68, of course. I told you I had developed myself as a mountaineer. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I was pretty confident that going up the central gully by myself would be, uh, would be safe and reasonable, uh, which it was. And I enjoyed myself, but I got to the top. I was a little concerned about the wind, and I almost crawled up onto the flat and before I stood up because they were, you know, they were talking about 50-mile-an-hour winds, and 50-mile-an-hour wind is when you start getting knocked down. I mean, you yeah. get about 50-mile-an-hour winds, and it's very hard to move. Mm -hmm. um, you can move in a 50-mile-an-hour wind, but it's pretty much the limit. Well, yeah. I got I stood up. The wind wasn't too bad. And I said, okay, so now I've accomplished my day, and I'm scooting across the Alpine Garden and down the Lion's Head Winter Trail, which is a different, which is, which is different than today's Winter Trail. Yes. Um, but but that, that's a minor detail. But um, um, but now, as one, one question I do have is, um, so a, as you're coming up, Ken and Ali, are, they hit the summit, they're coming down, and now I'll I'll just give you my bear. I mean, I've been on Mount Washington multiple times. I've always come up the Imanusik side because I'm coming up with mm -hmm. friends, and it's like it's just it's less stressful, you know. It's just coming up that way. I and, was there yesterday. <laughs> yeah, and I I um and I I do go up in this in the spring, in the summer, in the fall on the on the Pinkham Notch side, but um. I'm trying to visualize, even in the worst conditions I've been on, and I've been in icy conditions where I've needed crampons coming up the cone from from lakes of the cloud clouds. Um, I still can't visualize how somebody. So essentially, what happened with Ken and Ali is they slipped, they fell about 800 to 1,000 feet down from the summit. I still can't visualize how they would directly fall in those conditions without at least, you know, having some stoppage on a rock or a boulder. Or it sounds like the snow was completely filled in and then it just created like a sheet of ice. But was that common back then? Because I feel like it's... Well, you have on that side of the mountain, I mean, if you've, if you've been up like the Tuckerman Ravine Trail, yeah. um, to, to the right, if you're going up, is what they call the Southeast Snowfield. Mm -hmm. And it's uh, it's so it's it's pretty much a snowfield. Now there's occasional rocks stick out, and I've skied that south this the snowfield on occasion, and people do glissade down that snowfield. And I think Ken Hokinson had done it previously, um, but the mistake he made that day was he didn't really anticipate um, these icy. I'm, I'm a little surprised because he had been up there before. He was experienced. 
they had come up from the lake of the clouds. They should have seen that these icy conditions um, that he sort of underestimated what it was going to be like going down that way, as opposed to maybe just just stick to the Tucker and Ravine Trail. Yeah, yeah. Ironically, two days later, a, a student from was it BU? BU, or, yeah, BU. You know, you, yeah. There was a BU group, student group up there, and somebody slipped. And, you know, it's not, once you start falling, it's not that easy to stop. Yeah. <laughs> and, you know, you can self-arrest and stuff, but it, it, if you don't get it quick, uh, you're flying. And, it, and a BU student died, and it was, again, because of the same, this, I, you know, this, this, this freeze-up after rain had created those conditions. And they, they were even on the trail, so it, was, it wasn't as steep, and there was more, you know, less likely to happen. But I think that was kind of the mistake that they made, and then maybe they got knocked off their feet by the wind. It wasn't a little, it was a little unclear. Mm-hmm. Uh, but they, you know, what's remarkable to me, and and is how they came all the way down the summit cone. But when you get to the bottom of the summit cone, it's still like I don't know, at least a hundred yards, or you know, two hundred yards over to across Alpine Garden. It's flat. Yeah. And somehow they had gone all. They had not only gone down that steep part, but they had gone right across the flat part too, which indicates how fast and, and icy it was. Because if they had been farther back, I might not have even seen them. True, uh, yeah, true. And you're worried about the wind, and you're sort of like, I'm heading over to Lion's Head. Yeah. So you get up, you you basically top out from Huntington at the, you know, within, I think a, probably it sounds like, I don't know what the exact time is, but it sounds like to me it was probably within... 20 minutes or so you top out they had already you know slid Ken unfortunately had passed away Um, Ali had worked to get Ken at least into partially into a sleeping bag and then made the the, probably the heart wrenching decision that he had to move on Um, so you come upon that scene just as Ali's heading to Lion's Head can you talk about that a little bit? Yeah I looked across toward Lion's Head and I saw somebody now again, I had seen one or two people that day. You know, so I saw somebody, and I I thought I saw, which turned out to be true, dropped a pack, and it went sliding down into what's the ravine of Raymond Cataract, which is mm-hmm. a, a ravine. A, 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 it's not a big glacial ravine, but it's between Huntington and Tucker and Ravine. And I thought, boy, that was really odd. What was that all about? But I was kind of well. I'll get over there and I'll find out because I was going that way anyway, so there wasn't any question about it. But then. As I came across, I saw Ken Hoganson in the sleeping bag, and I thought, you know, you, you don't know what to think. My first reaction is, oh, somebody's camping here. Well, no, nobody's camping. Here. That's ridiculous. And, you know, I quickly I realized, you know, this was a dead man. And, and you know, and I, him and I took off my gloves. They blew off the mountain. That's, <laughs> well, I always had backup gloves. That's no problem. In fact, I even had a pair for Ali, for Ali when I came up on him later. I, I was I usually, when I used to go ice climbing, I'd have three pairs. I mean, I'd have two backups. And I used them both that day. Um, so, I mean, I think one of the lessons of all of this is, uh, um, well, as, I, as I've given talks to other people, I say, well, you, you know, you're going to have stuff. You know, you never know what you're going to need or, or you want, if, you, if you suddenly break your ankle. or. But you also need to be thinking, what if I came on somebody else? What if I came on a scene? Right. Uh, I think that's a takeaway, you know, that you got to be – are you going to be prepared to be able to help somebody else? Are you going to have enough equipment or whatever to be able to, to do that or, 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 or the wherewithal? Um, so, uh, you know, I, I kind of knelt down and – I, I put my hand on his chest. It was still warm. I looked in his face. I'm trying to, yeah, I was trying to take a pulse, but it was like, you know, the wind is howling, blowing. You, you can't hear anything. I'm kind of screaming in this guy's face, and it was pretty evident to me that he was dead. I mean, it's, it's, it was it was incredibly shocking and, and like, you know, who, you never expect to be put in a situation like that, but there I was. Um, and, you know, it was sort of hard to leave him in a way, but I knew there was somebody else over there. Obviously, this guy got in his hand, got in that sleeping bag by himself. That was pretty yeah. clear. It was pretty clear that I assumed that he had hit his head on the rocks at some point. Probably it was what had killed him, my, my assumption. Um, although, you know, who really knows? But, um, you know, I left and I headed over to, now again, you know, no cell phones or anything. You know, yeah, way yeah. For that, so I headed over to Lion's Head, knowing that, that, that there was, you know, there was somebody else over there, 
And I, as I approached Lion's Head, if you go across the Alpine Garden Trail, you kind of, you kind of drop down to Lion's Head. Mm-hmm. So I'm coming up behind this guy, sitting on the rocks at Lion's Head, and I'm thinking, well, what am I going to say? You know, yeah. <laughs> so I said, well, I, I said, well, hello, or you know, <laughs> how are you? Or <laughs> I mean, it was just one of these strange experiences. But this guy turns around, and he had he had blood uh, hanging off of his beard. He had lost his gloves and his hands. They were just frozen. He, he, they had plenty of clothes, but it, it, you can see how the, the, he had shred right through like his wind pants and his, his wool pants. They didn't have so much fleece back then. Yeah. And uh, the long johns, whatever, you could see bare skin on his legs. I mean, it was kind of horrifying. Do you, um, and I don't know, there's no way for you to know this with certainty, but do you think like if, if you had not come upon him um, and then, you know, Tom and Chris obviously helped out, but do you think Ali would have got down on his own or was he was he close to being done at that point? Well, that's a good question. Maybe those two guys could have got him down. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, they didn't have as much experience. I mean, they were, you know, there were two, what happened is two guys are coming up the trail. Yeah. You know, now, now, now picture, you know, on a winter day nowadays, and it was it was actually a fairly nice day. Although, I mean, as it turned out. Yeah, because you get out of the wind so, and it's, it's there was no problem. Wind and you could, but you could, there was views and it wasn't such a bad day. And uh, my first reaction is, it's me and this guy. This isn't going to be easy. I mean, I was very connected. I felt very connected to him. Like I'm going to help this guy. I yeah. got out my extra gloves. I get. I had a, a vest. I put on. And I put on some more clothes. And um, but what happened was there were two guys coming up the trail, and uh, on their way to the top, and they'd spent the night in Herman Lake. Their names are Chris and Tom, um, and um, and that sure made made me excited because I was thinking, man, this is not going to be easy to get this guy down by myself. Oh yeah, I bet. Uh, and and uh, um, so I kind of left. The, I, I kind of left Ali for a minute because I didn't want to explain what was going on to these two guys in front of him. I just went down and told them, and it was perfect because one guy was going to go down. And I said, what? I said, you go down and get help, and and the other guy stay with me. And uh, and I thought it was important to write a message, and I tried to write it up with some toilet paper. That didn't work too good. The wind's piling, you know. It was like up there, and uh, and it, 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 it's sort of an interesting aspect of the story. This guy Chris takes out a little Bible, which I which I gave, afterwards he let me keep, and I wrote a note on there. <laughs> I mean, I knew the caretaker down at. Um, and Tuckerman's ravine was was a guy named Joe Gill. So I wrote a message to Joe, you know, dead guy, and I wrote it on there. And I made an assumption these guys didn't have crampons or what were they doing up there, but they, they did, as it turned out. I mean, they, you know, they had lost them. The crampons ripped off um, uh, somewhere. And uh, so um, anyway, uh, Chris went down, and Tom and I were uh, – we're, we're, we're going to get this guy down. And I, I never had any doubt we'd get him down. And maybe that's just the confidence that comes with experience. I mean, I actually remember that once where I was with, with, with uh, Ali and helping him down. It's kind of a positive experience. I was kind of t- tested and enjoying myself and doing my, doing my, doing my, my best. And, you know, it was a beautiful day and the wind's howling. And, and uh, so... Um, you know, but I think of it as sort of the culmination of, of years of experience, and you know, I was confident that I would be able, we'd be able to do that. But yeah. uh, and you're in your prime at this point, like you've been, you've been be- well, doing big mountains for well, 10, 15 years. I was years slightly and, past my prime. I, well, I got yeah. married in 1981, and it's all I downhill to, from there, right? It was sort of a joke <laughs> with my wife. I used to refer to like the late 70s as the glory years, <laughs> right? And um, this is before we had children, and uh, you know I've been blessed with good health, and I'm you know I'm I'm 74 years old now. I got up, I got up, uh, I got I, 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 at least I'm under the book time, getting up to the Lake of the Clouds. That's I'm blessed, pretty good. I'm blessed to be able to do that, and uh, yeah. you know I've had good health, and. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, I, that was a period where you know I was I had done a lot of serious mountaineering at that point. Yeah. No, uh, there came a point where um, you know there's three of you. You're 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 helping with Ali. Um, now you could have just very easily just kept going down to Hermit Lake and and you know relied on Joe to get the get on the radio and and you know get some rescuers up there to get to to Ken. But you made the decision to go back up. 
Well, what happened was, um, um, you know, the, the uh, when 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 Chris Hardiman got down to the down to Tuckerm as they radioed up to the. You know, they, I mean, we had radios back then. I mean, they yeah. still have radios. <laughs> but uh, they, but they radioed up to the Mount Washington Observatory, and a guy named Albie Polkrobe was an experienced guy, and they he came down looking for Ken. He came down from the summit, and he somehow missed him. He didn't find him at, for, on the first take. And so at some point, we're going down the mountain, and two guys came up. And it wasn't actually Joe. I guess I, I thought it was Joe, but I, when I reread the account, Joe must have been on his day off. It was Peter Crane, who's well-known up there. He, were, he, he was the, he's a historian for the Mount Washington Observatory. I think he was working with Joe. And, and Peter Crane, and then there was an um, – who was the other guy? Was it, There was a guy – there were a couple guys climbing up there. I think it was was it Chris Hebert, but the, the other guy who um, was a pretty experienced climber who was with them, and they came up and they and when they, they, anyway they showed up with the litter and they're going to take they're going to take um, get we were at that point we were getting down below tree line and they were going to take them down and you know it was starting to look like we had the situation under control at least as far as for Ali and. Uh, but and meanwhile, Albie hadn't found they hadn't found Ken Hokinson, so they asked if I would go up and help him identify where he was. Yeah, well, I can't say I was too thrilled about turning around, I but, but I did at first. But um, at some point, I noticed I had a frostbit thumb, and I just said, "I, I think um, I think I'm going to go down." And uh, but they did eventually. Uh, those two guys plus Albie, they did find uh, Hokinson's body, and they stayed up there. They sat up there for a long time with him while there was a rescue. You know, they, they brought up uh, some mountain rescue service guys uh, from, uh, you know, from the Conway. They, they came up on a, on a snow cat up to the auto road and came across. It's not that far across, you know, from, to the Alpine Garden from the auto road. Um, and But, you know, they got him down in the middle of the night. You know, it wasn't, uh, you know, they were up there after dark. Yeah, and then you. So you had to. Did you go to the hospital right afterwards when you got down, or did well, you? I went down and I went into the. Uh, I went into the uh, the office there. This is a funny thing because Tom. You know, I'd been around AMC and I kind of knew kind of how they were organized. But it, it was a touching part of the story when Tom and Chris said that they got to the bottom. And they just got in their car and kind of drove home. Yeah. <laughs> and they didn't know, like, oh, check in over at the office. And you know, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So I went over to the office, and there was, uh, there was a couple of guys. I, there were people I knew. I knew people around the HUD system. And then there was a guy from the – because the, the, Fish and Game is also – well, technically, they, they're not responsible for the rescues on that side of the mountain. Mm-hmm. The, the Forest Service is. But anyway, Fish and Game guy was there, and then uh, I think it was it was a Dave Warren and uh, Mike Torrey. I think were people I knew, and and uh, you know they were and they were, you know so they're on the radios and communicating, and I kind of went in there and gave him a little report, and and I think uh, there was Joe or somebody you know put they, they put my thumb in, a, and they're supposed to heat it up and put it in <laughs> you know hot water for so many minutes or whatever they do you know for frostbite. Yeah. But I was feeling like, man, it was nice to have somebody taking care of me. I've been kind of the, I've been doing a lot of, even coming down the trail by myself, it was kind of a nice feeling. You know, the Tuck Trail it kind of felt flat. I remember it just felt flat. Yeah. I'm just walking down the trail. It was dark. I mean, at that point, you know, we got our headlamps. And- it's a long day, yeah. Now, at what point do you decide, like, okay, I'm going to put this, I'm going to put this together for, for an article? And then do you, uh, so we talk a lot about search and rescue events in the White Mountains, and we tend to, like, on the, on the podcast, Podcast. Like, I don't ever like reach out to people that are involved in the rescue situations. Like, I, I don't know. And, and we usually just kind of try not to. I used to be more judgmental about things. And, you know, you would be kind of like, oh, you know, that would never happen to me. But the more I've sort of looked at search and rescue situations, it's like, it yeah. can happen to anybody. And, Absolutely. you know, it's more about never, educating. For the grace of God goes on. I've seen that too on Facebook where people are quick to condemn. And, yeah. and you know, we get, any one of us can make a mistake at any yeah. time. And, and uh, <laughs> you know, even yesterday. Yes, I am. Yeah, but do you have any? Is is there any qualms? Yeah, is there any qualms about like okay, you know, uh, maybe this is too traumatic for people to talk talk about it? Was that not really a concern back then? Well, I don't know. I reached out to the people and they said they would. They do said it. yeah. So that's and, it. and Ali said he would do it. I mean, the next day, 
I went back to the hot. I mean, this was pretty uh, for me. I was pretty, you know, I don't know, traumatized. This was just a total life experience. You know, oh, like yeah. you can't think about anything else. I bet. And uh, my wife uh, and, and I drove up to the uh, the hospital in Gorham, and I went and visited, uh, you know, Ali in the in the in you know in the, in the hospital as they were taking care of him and. Um, unfortunately, I've lost, I lost contact here after him. Although since I've talked to you, I've been trying to track him down. I started oh, yeah. Googling last night and I found a phone number. I called, I left a message. Yeah. Um, so, uh, um, if, 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 if what I found out is right, he's still in Maine. Uh, oh, wow. but, um, maybe I'll, maybe I'll connect with him at some point. Then that would be interesting, but. I don't know. I mean, I suppose there is a sensitivity to that. I do feel, you know, as someone who grew up with Appalachia, I and mean, there's a lot of good stories to be told. And um, I think, um, in fact, in that new edition of Appalachia, there's there's two stories in there that I'm trying to I'm spacing out what they are right now. Should, yeah, but they're, they're a rescue, and I'm encouraging the author that we should have more major stories around the, we do have the accident reports in there, which people look at, and they. But but to have more personalized stories, so I'll tell you, I was I've been doing this hot naturalist thing, and um, two years ago, I was up at Lake of the Clouds, and um, just about this. Well, it was at the end of June, and um, um, somebody had died of hypothermia on the ridge. Right. Yep. Two days yeah. before. Two mm-hmm. days before. Um, and uh, later, and people were just buzzing about it. I mean, obviously, a death in the mountains, especially in the summertime. Yeah, yeah, because that know. was the um, that was like the day of the uh, Mount Washington Road Race that happened that day too, and that was a it was oh, a, was that right? It was just extremely cold. I'm assuming it's the it was the rain. June. It was yeah. extreme rain. Yeah. It was rain and cold. And you know, I'm up at Lake of the Clouds even yesterday, and they were talking about these severe thunderstorms. And you know, do, is it a good idea to cross the ridge? You know, over to Madison or mm-hmm. from Madison to Lakes? I mean, you know. Uh, um, you know, you're really exposed out there if the weather like, and they had, you know, they did have some bad thunderstorms, uh, but there weren't till last night. So um, you have to be really conscious of this. But that particular incident with this um, man who died in June 2023 um, was written up in one of the magazines. Oh, I, I forget which one, and and he had actually. Um, texted his wife during this whole traverse yeah. at one point he texted her and said I'm, I'm getting hypothermic but he didn't leave the ridge and he texted her two hours later and he said um, I can't move now and he died that's heartbreaking you know, so one of the, you know you gotta be ready to bail out but I think there's been some wonderful stories. I mean, Ty Gagne has written a couple of great books yeah. I don't know if you've interviewed Ty oh yeah, yeah we have we've interviewed him multiple times yeah um, his, his the, the the stories he's done about the mountain rescue and the, some of the psychology of it and how hypothermia affects people. Uh, Where you'll find me and the other one is what's the name of the other the one? last traverse. The last traverse is yep. probably the last traverse might be a little more identifiable to, for the average hiker because it yeah. was it was two kind of regular guys. They were they were conquered coach bus drivers and one mm-hmm. one of them had a tremendous amount of experience. And yet, you know, he didn't quite anticipate the forecast or, or whatever. So it's definitely true. This can happen to anybody. I mean, yesterday I'm coming down and it did start to rain as I was coming down the Jewel Trail. And, you know, I'm just being really, really cautious about where I step. I mean, you know, it doesn't take much. Um, and I've been lucky. And I've had, I've had some close calls. I, I wrote up some of my own personal close calls for another Appalachia story called Running yeah, we might have to have you. I think I feel like I got to have you back probably about ten times to go through some of this stuff because there's, there's some good stories. But one thing I did want to ask you about is like the the main reason why I got this uh, this version of the Summer '84 book is I was researching Michael Miller who had gone missing in um, November or October of '83. This was in Franconia and he was never located. And we had talked about this a little bit before we started recording. So you said you were on that search. Well, it was fascinating. Again, they didn't have the infrastructure for search and rescue. Yeah. But I had found out about it, and I went over and volunteered one day. And we were up on the, you know, up on the summit. I was with a fish cop, 
and I introduced myself. Said I were you know they they were you know they were you know, now with this with the with the like the PEMI search and rescue when those people show up they know they're people that are that are experienced and prepared. But I think in this particular case it was just people were showing up. Or at one point they had scouts doing a traverse, and I said to the fish cop, I said, you know, they're in an area with a lot of rocks, and I don't know if that's a good place. They, they had to make judgments about that. Um, so I had to introduce myself and say, you know, I used to work for the AMC, and so that I had some experience. But we were we were up looking up near up near the summit cone of Lafayette, like going into the sort of the crumb holes along the along the way, and. Um, um, yeah, I, mean, I didn't remember that name of that person, and I, to my recollection, it, it was funny you brought it up because I, I had never seen anything about that. That would be a good story for somebody to write about. The, the body was never found because they were lo- actually looking low down early on. They were looking below, um, like the bridal path, which you know, yeah. there's a whole uh, slope there between where the Greenleaf Trail is and the bridal path. They were down looking there, and then then somebody then they got a report that they somebody had seen them higher up. So all of a sudden that we were looking up higher, you know, up on, you know, kind of crawling around in the crumb hole. So I wonder if it was a situation similar to that young lady that had a tragic story last year, that young lady who died. Yeah, coming um, down Lafayette Brook. You, I mean, know. you know, people get coming down that trail and they, they kind miss of that turn, yep. miss that turn and they, they end up over, over into that Lafayette Brook drainage. Um, my guess is that's where he ended up over there somewhere. Yeah, yeah, but it's, I, 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 I couldn't recall that they had never found the body, but I was interested that you, yeah, you, no, you they, you've been doing more research on it. Yeah, yeah, and I did, uh, I did put a message out on Reddit. There's an unresolved um, mystery thing, and some of his family members chimed in about it because I did a summary on it, and uh, you know they did. This is some interesting tidbits. They said like he had a 35 millimeter camera on him, so you know you could go out there with a magnet and look around, see what you could pick up, and you know who knows. But it's it's tough to. Tough to know. I mean, it's yeah, literally it's a awesome. needle with a haystack in a haystack. Yeah, now especially, you know, so you got us. That's so it's been what seventeen, forty years. Yeah, yeah, it's 40, a long 40 time. years. Yeah. Um, but uh, you yeah, know, interesting, interesting um, story from eighty three, Doug. But I did, I have you for a few more minutes, and I wanted to touch on a couple of other topics. Uh, maybe not all specific to hiking, but I feel like you know we do general sort of New Hampshire topics as well. So one of the things that interested me is that you spent a number of years in the New Hampshire State Legislature. Um, do you have? Is there anything? Did you get involved at all in like search and rescue funding or funding for? Um, um, the development of trails or anything like that. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, well, I mean, you know, fish and game department, you know, in different states, there's different roles, but in New Hampshire fish and game department is responsible for rescues. And that, you know, that, and that, and that, that's been for a very long time. And you remember when I told you the fish and game, the fish cop, we call him the fish cop was down at the base of uh, Pinkham Notch that day mm-hmm. in the office when I came down. Um, so they have the official responsibility for it. Um, and over time, you know, there's more and more and more rescues. And so it became a big, it's been a, historically been a big issue in the legislature. How are we going to pay for this? And, the, you know, the argument is if somebody's got a, a, a snowmobile license or a ATV license or a hunting license, when they go searching for those people, um, they, uh, you know, they're at least contributing to fish and game. But uh, as more and more of these rescues, and it's phenomenal how many rescues there are. There's, there's something going on every week, or it seems. And and uh, and um, well, I, I want to make sure I tell you a story about the yeah. top of Mount Washington. And I'll come back to that being yeah. up there yesterday and the list of people that have died up there. Oh, I was yeah. about that before we're done. But um, you know, so the fishing game was had been pushing the legislature for more money. Well, in New Hampshire, we're very frugal when it comes to we don't have we don't have the sales and the income tax, but eventually, after many years, they developed that the hike safe card program. Uh, so it's it, it's really um, um, you know I encourage anybody who's hiking in the mountains to pay you know chip in the twenty five bucks. Um, it's not it's not really it's, it's it's not really so much about insurance. I mean, yes, they will bill people. Uh, who are negligent, but I don't think I don't think there's too many people who are negligent that have a hike safe card. So it's yeah. it's mostly just a way to contribute 
to the to the, to all the time that goes into those the, to the, the search, to search and rescue. Of course, now we have these other groups. We had the Mountain Rescue Service that they've been around longer, but you, 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 now you've got the PEMI uh, search and rescue, and you've got the Androscoggin search and rescue, and there's, I think there's one in the Upper Valley now yep. where you have um, you know, and, and if you're someone who's doing a lot of hiking and you'd like to contribute and that's not a great way to volunteer i mean you just have to be ready you're going to be called out who knows when yeah. you know that that you know like your friend was talking about um i never joined those groups i was overseas i lived overseas for a number of years and by the time i got back i was getting kind of older so i i, I, I at this point i'd be a liability in those but you, you never know when you're gonna come on the scene yeah. uh, search and rescue I happened on one up on Mount Cardigan where they were carrying somebody off yeah and, and if you do come across one of those like you know it's all yeah. hands on deck you know they're not yeah, going to ask exactly. you, you know, yeah. they'll, they'll be happy to take yeah. the, the work now one other thing about the New Hampshire State Legislature so you're involved in leadership training can you talk a little bit about um, you know my imp- it's, I'm always fascinated with the New Hampshire State Legislature because I'm a Massachusetts guy so we've got like these we got these politicians like they've got a full time job they're getting paid for their committee assignments. They got pensions. They got everything. So the New Hampshire State Legislature is very unique because it sort of goes back to sort of the founding principles of the country, where it's like a, it's really like a, a citizen legislature where it's not full time. Nobody's getting paid big money to be in the the legislature, but and you have a, the, a very high volume of legislatures or, or representatives in the legislature. So that breeds sort of a unique dynamic where yeah, you get. You know, you get more of a diverse background of people in the um, in the, the the legislature, but you may not get people that are as seasoned or trained like you would a classic politician from a place where it's like a full time job. So, can you talk a little bit about like sure. well, I mean, every state's that? different, and there's sort yeah. of two models. There's sort of the, what the, they call the volunteer legislature and yeah. the professional legislature. I mean, New Hampshire's on one extreme of the volunteer legislature. Right. Yeah. And, yeah. First of all, it's, it's a small state. There's only 1.3 million people or whatever. And it's also got a very big legislature, 400. It's one right. of the biggest. So you don't represent that many people. And it's in the Constitution. You get paid $100 a year. Now, that used to be uh, maybe when the state Constitution was passed, that was a fair amount of money. But uh, it isn't much right now. All I will say is the only job I ever had where you get paid two years in advance. They gave me a check for 197 They take out a little Social Security or whatever. But, um, I mean, that is part of the ethos of the New Hampshire legislature. And I did it for 12 years. It was a wonderful experience. Um, you know, politics now is getting has gotten so divisive. And um, my biggest project these days, I do. Uh, I mentioned that I would I was overseas. I ran the Peace Corps, and and uh, I went in Ukraine. I was in Ukraine when Putin invaded in 2014, and I had Peace Corps volunteers. And I also went through Ebola and West Africa. I was evacuating Peace Corps volunteers. I was sort of the bad luck country director. Jeez. But when I came back home in uh, 2016. I, I did. St- I have a small uh, consulting business, Growing Leadership LLC, I, and I do. I, that I'm I'm passionate about leadership, but I spend most of my time these days volunteering with a group called Braver Angels that's trying to get people to have respectful conversations across the political divide. Um, just because you don't agree with me doesn't mean you're evil and you're stupid. And when I was in the legislature, there was that was much more the spirit of it. You know, we disagreed with each other, but it didn't mean you you weren't a patriot. And we've gotten into this very nasty situation. I'd really encourage people to go check out braverangels.org. There's a lot of free workshops you can attend. And I was just out in uh, Kenosha, Wisconsin at a national convention a couple weeks ago. And what's exciting, I'm back working with the legislature because we now have a caucus of legislators who are interested in this. In this, And one of them came out to Kenosha to, to the Braver Angel convention. So I have a, I have a, I'm, I'm still working with the New Hampshire legislature. I'm not – just strictly as a volunteer, uh, yeah. but uh, I'm, I'm proud of that work, and it's sort of. I'm also writing a book right now. I'm very passionate about this work. It's called Beyond the Politics of the Contempt: yeah. Practical Steps You Can Take to Make Our Country Better. So, just getting people to sort of step back and think about how are we treating each other, and, and I do encourage people to check out BraveAngels.org. Yeah, and it is. And I had my, sort of my own journey during like COVID, where I was like, you know, I would see people that were, you know, f- 
family members, cutting off family members over different yeah. disagreements and things like that. And I, I had my own sort of epiphany. And I actually did stumble upon Braver, Braver Angels, and I learned about like the the hidden tribes model, which is a nice way to look right, at things. Just exactly. to say, like, all right, it's not yes. it's not Team A and Team B. It's actually there's like seven or eight teams, and it's really two teams that are on the extremes of you know the 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 sides that suck up all the oxygen in the room everybody focuses on them but there's these five or six other groups of people that don't really you know don't have that same agenda and the things that we do now it's like the media is set up basically to cater to the divisiveness because that's what gets the clicks and that's the revenue exactly. model and the, the legislatures and our leaders because sort of play into that but like in the old days you know you'd have the my understanding is like tip o'neill and Whoever they would have dinner together, and through exactly. eating and things like that, they would uh, the they would be able to keep a channel of communication together. And I think we're missing that. And you know, I, I don't know if it's going to be solved anytime soon. But I appreciate you, you know, working on trying to figure out a way to do that. Well, this is what I'm committed to, and I'm glad you mentioned that Hidden Tribes report. People can Google that, but they talk about the exhausted majority of the people who aren't on the extremes, who aren't pushing the extreme agenda, and and and, and you know, people. You know, we have a lot more in common than we realize, but there are people out there that are trying to divide us. We call them conflict entrepreneurs. People, there's people making money and power by being divisive. And uh, we've got to step back and say, wait a minute, just because you don't agree with me, that means, you know, of course you can have disagreements in politics. You should have disagreements, but that doesn't, let's not, let's not personalize it. And, and one of my chapters in my book is how did family, how did, how did politics become more important than family? Just what you were talking about. Yeah, I yeah. think it's, it's, it's terrible. That people are, are 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 having these issues with family members over politics. But can yeah. I just tell one story? I know we're coming up on the end. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, sure. Go ahead. Well, you know, uh, uh, some years ago, when I was up on top of Mount Washington, I discovered they have a they have a plaque up there. The people that died on you know, Mount Washington, they define it kind of loosely as the as the as the I think the presidential range. And uh, Ken Hokinson is number 98 on that list. And I always sort of took a moment when I was, after I realized they had that list and, and when I, I was up there, I would, I would always just kind of have a little sacred moment next to that plaque, which I happen to have yesterday. I don't get up there that often, maybe once a year. Um, but, uh, you know, that was a terrible loss of life and I, I feel terrible about it, but I, at the same time, for me, that was a very meaningful experience that really shaped my life in a lot of ways in terms of uh, some, some sort of the spiritual values of my own life. I think I used to be a little more critical of people before that, and I, over time I became a little more tolerant and a little more respectful, a little less judgmental of people, and I take that away from that experience. And I'm sorry that it had to, it had to take someone's life, but... Uh, just, it was just a coincidence. I was up there yesterday, standing next to that plaque, and, and uh, it was just a solemn, special moment for me. So um, I'm, I'm delighted that you found my story, and I'd encourage people to check it out if you can, if you can get an old Appalachia or get the book No Limits But the Sky, which is an AMC. They, they took some of the be- some selection of articles over the years from Appalachia, and that's still in print, I believe. The Appalachian Mountain Club has yeah. that account. And, um, and, you know, the lessons are, uh, you know, be prepared when you're out there. You never quite know what, you know, what you might find either, either in your own, in yourself or your injury or trying to prevent that. And also be prepared if, if you happen to be on the scene and someone needs your help. Um, because, uh, you know, we all, that's, that's part of the sort of the responsibility of, uh, of being out in the mountains. And the mountains have been such a big part of my life. And, um, I'm just grateful. I'm grateful for all the experiences I've, I've had, and I'm I'm grateful I'm still able to do it. I did Mount Washington yesterday at age 74, and uh, I'm not breaking any uh, speed records, but uh, I got down in one piece, and uh, I'm grateful for it. Yeah, and I, I appreciate you taking the time to uh, to sit down with me. And uh, you know, fate. I'm glad that uh, you know you and Chris came together, and he was able to give me your number, and I could reach out. Um, you know, and I think the thing that I take away is like what you said is exactly right. Like, be prepared. You know, it's not just about your own safety, but you may need to get you make you could get called into action at any one time. So have three pairs of gloves. You know, it's a little heavy, but 
you know, have everything that you need in order to, you know, spring into action if you need to. And, uh, and Doug, definitely, I think I, I've got a bunch of questions that I could, I could cover with you, but we're limited on time. I want to talk about, I'd love to talk about like that you're developing the trail system on Hancock and the arrow slide and all that. You know, let's stay in touch and maybe we can, we can get back together and, and, and cover another topic. I'd be delighted to do that. And I thank you, Mike, for the work you're doing. Yeah, appreciate it. So um, thank you very much. All right, Stomp. So what do you think? Pretty interesting, huh? Yeah, good stuff. What, a, what um, an interesting I mean, the, life. It's a crazy story. The one one comment I have, just yes. for the sake of time, is that I love the fact that he calls conservation officers fish cops. <laughs> <laughs> it's like, you could, it, it just pegs him to a specific generation. It's so yes. great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but he's he's great, and uh, he's. I think he mentioned it. I think on the show, but he's probably. He said he's one of the most prolific article writers for the Appalachia Journal. So documenting that history is so important. You, I mean, oh yeah, you never know. Incredible. Yes. Um. All right. Stomp. So I've got another. So I've been working overtime. What have you been doing here? I got another segment I did. Well, this is this seems like punishment for the whole Aurora segment because now I have to edit these two gigantic segments. That's true. <laughs> that is true. But but anyway, so I had mentioned this um, probably a week or two ago. But I had um, Scott Ugly had reached out to me and had given me a heads up about the the race series that they're they're doing for the Loon Echo Land Trust. And again, this is the Lakes Region, Western Maine is my hood. So I immediately wanted to jump on this, and I've been talking to Scott a little bit over email so he was able to uh, sit down with me and um, we had Addy as well and they're both the two organizers of the races that are coming up so uh, let's go in and we'll find out a little bit about the Loon Echo Land Trust and a little bit about the race series and then we'll come out and do uh, recent search and rescue oh actually no we'll do your lost person strategy and then recent search and rescue okay cool sounds great okay bidloo, 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 bidloo. <laughs> So welcome, Scott and Addy, to uh, the Slasher Podcast. Uh, Scott, have you ever been on a podcast before? No, first time on a podcast. First time, all right. Well, Addy, you look like you, you've got a little bit of broadcasting experience, I'm going to guess. Have you ever been on a podcast before? I've been on one for trail running. Trail running? What did you? How, what was the name of the podcast? Do you remember? I think it was the All In Trails. Nope. I actually don't remember. <laughs> So, yeah, yeah. And then, so you're a trail runner. Uh, did you, you, you sort of talk about your trail running exploits? Yeah, we're both big trail runners. Um, we do a lot of the White Mountain Endurance races. We did Jigger Johnson last year. Uh, we run all over the Whites. It's like our favorite thing to do. Okay. All right. Well, I'm going to ask you a little bit about Jigger Johnson because I'm curious about that later. But um, so you're both here. So Scott had reached out to me to talk a little bit about the the Loon Echo Land Trust, um, which is a nonprofit organization that uh, conserves, protects, and maintains um, a lot of trails in the Lakes region of Maine. So I call it like the Western Maine area. Um, and typically, you can sort of look out on most of the mountains on the Whites, and you can see like Pleasant Mountain and other areas sticking out. Um, and, I, and I get over there quite a lot. But, um, and there's a, there's a couple of trail races that are coming up in September and October that we're going to talk about. But I guess maybe to start off with um, Scott and Addy, if you could both introduce yourself. Scott, you can start off. Tell a little bit about yourself, uh, your background, a little bit about how you got into outdoor activities. For sure. So I had a, a pretty non-traditional start to hiking and trail running, I would say. I was very much not an athletic kid, uh, sort of in my early years and throughout high school. Uh, I was more of a music kid. Um, I would say sort of in my mid-20s, I started road running just for more of the health benefits of it. Um, I just felt like I needed to start exercising probably spent a solid two years as a road runner doing 5Ks, 10Ks, half marathons, road marathons. Um, and then one of my buddies turned me on to this incredibly epic hike that I'm sure many of you know, and that's the Presidential Traverse. Um, once I heard about that, I was sort of like, I got to do this. Uh, so it took two attempts for me to do at first, but I did end up completing it. 
I do remember driving home the day that I did the presidential traverse, seeing them, seeing the mountains in my rear view mirror and just being like, man, like it, it just really drew me to the mountains. I couldn't get enough. I, I was then out there every single weekend tackling the 48 and that sort of evolved from hiking into trail running and sort of where I'm at today, sort of doing trail races and, and competing in the circuits and stuff like that. Awesome. And then, Addie, what's your what's your background with, with hiking and outdoor adventures? Yeah, so I grew up in the Lakes region of Maine, um, so grew up hiking. My grandmother was a big hiker. She was also, like, an adventurer. She climbed mountains out in the Alps and in the Himalayas, and she did the 4,000-footers back in the 80s and 90s. So I grew up seeing, like, her pictures of it and her telling stories, and I couldn't wait to do them myself. So as soon as I was old enough to drive... I was out in the whites every single day, every single weekend, doing the 48. Um, I was mostly a hiker at first, a backpacker, and then I discovered that if I ran, I could cover a lot more ground in a day, so I started trail running through that, Um, and yeah, now that's what we do. Awesome, and then you're both involved with the the Loon Echo Land Trust. How, How involved are you? Are you just supporting the race series, or do you also work in support of the the Land Trust? And I guess, Scott, you can answer that. Uh, so we uh, do work for Loon Echo Land Trust just on a volunteer basis. Our capacity is uh, mostly within the realm of the race series. Um, so, yeah, we're not like full-time employees of the Loon Echo Land Trust, but we really love what we're doing, and we uh, gladly volunteer our time um, to help fundraise and run these races for them. Awesome. And Addie, can you speak a little bit about the, so just for the listeners, like the, the, the areas that I think would be most familiar is like Pleasant Mountain in Denmark, which is used to be called Shawnee Peak. I talk about it actually a lot on the show because it's like one of my go-to places to go hiking when I get, when I don't have a lot of time. Uh, but there's a, but there's a bunch of other locations and generally the, there's 14 preserves in the Loon Echo Land Trust spread out across uh, Western Maine. But can you give like your, your summary on, on what the trust overseas okay uh yeah so lunaco conserves land across seven towns um in the lakes region so it's denmark naples sebago bridgeton harrison casco and raymond uh they have 9300 acres of protected land and 32 over 32 miles of trails um some of them the more popular ones are like The big one is Pleasant Mountain. That was sort of the catalyst to a lot of the conservation that they've done. Um, But we also have a bunch of local stuff. We have like Pondicherry Park, uh, which is in downtown Bridgeton. We have Hackers Hill in Casco. That's really popular. We host like film festivals, live music, sunsets, yoga, and all sorts of things there. Um, There's places like Raymond Community Forest where there's even rock climbing. It's There's kind of something for everyone where if you want to, you can go out and run 20 miles on Pleasant Mountain or you can access like a wheelchair accessible trail in Pondicherry Park. There's there's always something for everyone. I think, I mean, I love Pleasant Mountain. I'm on ski patrol at Pleasant Mountain. I spend so much time there running and skiing. Um, but we're also big fans of Bald Pate. You can, you can link a surprisingly, like, a good run there uh, with all the loops and all the trails you can do. Yeah, and I get I get asked a lot. Like um, people will say, "Oh, you know, what is there to do? You know, what's what's sort of a hidden gem?" And I always tell people, like, a great day for me is to go to downtown Bridgeton, and like I'll poke around like the bookstore down there. I'll go to Rennie's. I'll go to the corn store, and then walk around that Pondicherry area. And then there's an I think there's another museum over there as well. Like it's a great way to um, to spend an afternoon. And um, I think that that Pondicherry area, I know it's it's wheelchair accessible, and it's got some great areas. I don't think it's a ton of mileage on there, but you can you can go back in there and get lost for a little while. Yeah, definitely. Uh, and there's another one that's close to where we live that has recently developed a good amount of trails on it, the Crooked River Forest in Harrison. You pretty much never see people there, but it's gorgeous. It follows the river. It's super, super peaceful, and Fluvial Brewery is right down the road, so you can make a day out of it as well. Yeah, and do you... I, I know, like, I'm a runner as well. Like, I run basically... 
you know, usually about 25, 30 miles a week. And I do some trail running, uh, but I, I, I try to shy away from the, the, the crazy up and downs when I'm doing trail running. So I prefer to try to find trails that are flat. So I'm assuming that if you're like me, these areas here, you can find a, a fair amount of uh, trail running where you don't have to do a lot of up and downs. It's a little bit flatter, right? Yeah, I would say the Crooked River Forest would be really good for that or Pondicherry Park. I know for a while they were hosting an intro to trail running series there. Um, um, so that's a good spot. Bald Pate is like sort of an in-between, and then Pleasant would be one of the harder ones. Okay. And then if you want to climb and get some views, then it's it's Pleasant Mountain and Bald Pate would be the two that give you a little bit of elevation and some views, right? Yeah, definitely. Especially Pleasant. The network of trails on there are gorgeous. Uh, really, you could you could do a lot there. It's a small mountain, but there's a lot. Yeah, yeah. So I've uh, I got to check. I probably hiked every trail and went from every trailhead there. So for Pleasant Mountain, for people that haven't done it, essentially, like you can go up. There's like a fire warden's trail or a fire trail um, that's kind of along the ski resort, the ski hills, and then there's Bald Peak, which is off of Mountain Road, which is that's my that's kind of my favorite ascent. Um, and then that brings you along a ridge where you can do blueberry picking this time of the year and then brings you out to a fire tower. Have you guys ever climbed the fire tower? I know you're not supposed to, but I do climb it up to like to touch the bottom of it at least. I think like in high school, yeah. <laughs> you can't yeah. help it. I know. Oh, I'm in my 50s now and I still I still sneak up there. So. <laughs> um, but it's good. Now, how many times have you, have you climbed uh, Pleasant Mountain, Addy, do you think? Oh, I don't know. I, I mean, between growing up here and we run it like once a week, sometimes like multiple times in the same run, probably like a hundred something times, like yeah. a lot. I tell people too, um, Pleasant Mountain and Burnt Mountain, um, they do not give you any, like you're, you're on the treadmill on you know, 12 degree, like right away. That's the one thing that I always tell people about Pleasant Mountain and Burnt Meadow is that, you know, you're going up. And even though people think of these mountains as like, oh, they're these small little mountains over in Western Maine, the hiking on them can be as tough as some of the 52 with the views for sure. Yeah. And I think another one is there's actually a fastest known time route on the mountain where if you do all the trails, it's called the Pleasant Mountain Quad. So if anyone's a hardcore hiker or runner, that's it's like 18 miles. It's it's a good one. Really? And it's an established route? Yeah. For Okay. I'm going to have to check that out for sure. Um, all right. So then both of you are you're involved in the trust. You help volunteer. Do you do trail maintenance and or are you mostly just doing the um, the, the, the race series right now? Yeah, uh, we have done some trail maintenance in conjunction with the race series. So we just had the Fluvio 5K on August 3rd, um, and that connected from Fluvio Brewing in Harrison down to the Crooked River Forest. And in order to have that course, uh, we created, we basically converted a snow, like a winter snowshoe trail into a year round trail. So we were out there many many hours weed whacking and clearing the trail um, and then we also cleared an old snowmobile trail to connect the preserve to the brewery so a lot of trail maintenance with that and hopefully that year-round trail can stay now um, but with others I mean Pleasant Mountain is so so well used that the trails are pretty well maintained there um, they actually bring in professional trail crews for things like that oh yeah they like that bald peak um, tra- I mean it's got nice stairways and it's got everything I haven't been over on the ledges side lately I, I, I've been going mostly up bald but um, I know that both of those trails are really well well developed so um, it's impressive now though there's a, there's like a partnership with private landowners for that mountain do you, do you Scott do you know anything about that uh, so from what I understand, Luneco Land Trust um, purchased uh, a lot of the land on Pleasant Mountain, aside from okay. the ski resort. There is some private land that sort of borders it, um, and that stuff is usually clearly marked. But in terms of all the trails, if you stay on trail at Pleasant Mountain, you're just on Luneco Land Trust land, which they own outright. Um, okay. So there's usually no issues there with private land, but... Okay. And can you, Scott, talk about the uh, the two races that are coming up? So you have one race that is coming up on September 7th, and then there's another one on October 5th. 
Yeah, absolutely. Uh, so the first race that we have coming up is the Ball Pate 10K. That's, as you said, on September 7th, first Saturday in September. Um, so that one summits Ball Pate uh, three times, gives you a total elevation gain of 1,800 feet. I'd say even for a small race, it has a lot to offer. Um, anything you can think of in a trail run. It's got technical single track. It's got a steep climb. If anyone knows Pate Trail, that's a really steep <laughs> trail up to the summit there. You got bombing down hills. I assure you, you'll get covered in mud. There'll be scenic vistas, uh, great views. Um, of course, the the next race in the series, uh, which I really like to call our premier race, that's the Pleasant Mountain Race, first Saturday in October, October 5th. Um, you will definitely be feeling the elevation gain in that one. Uh, you'll go up Bald Peak. You won't completely summit. You'll come down Fire Warden's Trail, sort of circumnavigate around the bottom of it, and then make your way up Southwest Ridge, uh, which is my personal favorite trail up the mountain. Um, then you will get to the summit, sort of go all the way across the ridge, go past Bald Peak, and uh, come down Sue's Way. Um and uh, I'm not sure. Maybe maybe you've done Sue's Way, Mike, uh, but oh, yeah. it gets pretty rocky and technical out there. But it's a really good one. I feel like a lot of people uh, uh, don't don't venture out that way. But it's one of my favorites on the mountain as well. All right, and then you're gonna have live music. There'll be food and beer that's served. Is is the is the uh, the start is right by Shawnee the 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 I call I'm gonna call it Shawnee Peak. I always do. I'm never gonna get that out of my head. But it's in the parking lot of the ski area. Is that where you're starting? Yeah, correct. So it's it's not at the main lodge. It starts at the East Ski Lodge, which is just a little bit uh, further down Mountain Road uh, if you're coming from 302. Um, and, and yes, you are correct. So we have a full-on after party happening at the event. Uh, so we'll have live music. We'll have a food truck there. We'll have a beer garden serving beer. So, you know, hopefully it'll be a good time. Okay, and I'll make sure that I, I've already put out the details on the show notes, but I'll make sure that we uh, we put them in the show notes and we'll send them out over our social as well so p- people can sign up. And are you both running it or are you going to be running around organizing everything? Uh, so we'll probably be running around like uh, chickens with our heads cut off <laughs> for most of the race, just trying to make sure everything goes off um, without a hitch. Okay. Uh, and then, Addy, do you have any big races planned uh, besides these two um, coming up? I think for running, for us, both of us are going to do the Big Brad 50 miler uh, in October in Bradbury Mountain State Park in Freeport, Maine. Um, okay. Other than that, we pretty much have just been exploring trails ourselves and, and having fun out. All right. And early, you had mentioned that you, you both did the Jigger Johnson last year. Can you talk a little bit about that experience? Uh, yeah, definitely. So uh, I was actually, uh, I was a part of the inaugural 100 mile event last year, um, which uh, I don't know if you remember last year, the weather was uh, pretty wet. Um, it's like you would get to an aid station, change your shoes, swap out your socks. Within being on the trail in five minutes, your feet were just like wet again. So your feet were just wet the entire time. Um, but it was, it was totally epic. Um, I mean, it took me like, 48 hours or so to complete the thing but it was wow. <laughs> it was an absolutely legendary race one of the best times of my life honestly i would totally do it again wow and how, how did your feet hold up being wet all that time you know they actually held up pretty well i'll have to say i did not lose a single toenail um shout out to uh joseph cloyd who uh helped me out with some foot care at an aid station um which uh you know shout out to one of our sponsors squirrels nut butter um <laughs> l- <laughs> lather that on your feet before you put your sock back on and it sort of keeps the water at bay and prevents you from blistering so that i think that was really sort of like key to keeping my feet in good condition wow well that's impressive and then Addie, did you did you run the same distance 
Uh, so I did the 100K. Um, okay. So I started a day after Scott and actually got to run into him on the course, which was really cool. Uh, we both had glitter on our faces, so we were known as Glitter Guy and Glitter Girl. <laughs> oh, nice. Um, yeah, so it took me, I think, 27 hours. Uh, so I finished three hours after Scott, and he actually like stood at the finish line and waited for me to finish. So kudos to Scott for that. <laughs> what a guy, what a guy. And then, Addie, while I have you, so you're a real townie. Like, you know, so uh, we're in Brownfield. My father-in-law's in Brownfield, so I feel like Brownfield's like looked down upon for, for these other towns, but I don't know. I don't know for certain, but... Um, Naples, Harrison, Bridgeton. Like I grew, matter of fact, I grew up going to Long Lake. I've been going to Long Lake since I was fourteen with my friends. Um, but this whole area here, so I need to know from you, what are some hidden gems? Like, if there's pl- are there places to eat, places to drink, where where do you tell the um, the people that don't know that area that well, if they want to spend a day in Bridgeton or Naples or Harrison, like where, where are you sending them? I think to start, I mean. I work in Norway, which is two towns north of Harrison, and I work at 290 Main Street, which is a pub um, right on Main Street there, and that's a great spot. That's a great spot not too far north. Um, if you go somewhere like Sunday River, if you go to Evans Notch or Grafton Notch, it's not too far out of the way, so that's a, a nice spot. Uh, in Norway, I think around town, um, I think Standard Gastro Pub in Bridgeton is really good. I think Queen's Head is new. I haven't been there yet. Oh, okay. uh, Scott, you work at he works at Fluvio Brewing in Harrison, so that's always a good spot. Uh, okay. Yeah, I mean, uh, I, so, I also right, I'll should check those out. I've never been to those. I, I should also plug uh, that uh, the pub up at Pleasant Mountain Blizzards is also now open during the summer. Um, so that's also a good place to get some food, especially if you're just hiking right down the road on a mountain road there, either at Ledges or Ball Peak. You can just swing right right by Blizzards Pub and grab something. Uh, but really, you can't go wrong okay. with anything off of Main Street in uh, Bridgeton. I think pretty much all those restaurants are pretty solid if you're if you're looking for some good good eats. Okay, yeah, because we we end up going down to Naples to the Causeway a lot, and um, going down by that area there. But I gotta I gotta check out Bridgeton in a little bit more detail in the food scene there. Excellent. And then, as far as hiking goes in the White Mountains, are you both pursuing anything interesting? Four thousand footers, fifty two with a view, terrifying twenty five. Uh, so I would say I am vaguely working on my t25 right now um kind of working on my 67 uh and my new england ultra 8 uh i believe i've got two left on that taconic crest and devil's path no three because i have the uh, great range traverse as well left on there but i'm sort of like a like a loose list goer um sort of right now we've just been focusing on sort of exploring some of the less traveled trails in the whites uh like i don't know if you've ever been out there mike maybe maybe you could expand on this as well if you've ever done the dry river trail there i haven't that is um that is one that Stomp has talked about quite a bit because he he was over there because of a rescue, but that's an area that I got to get over to. Um, but he was saying that like really hard to follow, a lot of washouts, um, and just like a black hole when it comes to just the, the staying on the trail there. So yeah. I got to get over there too. Yeah, exactly. It's it really is a great trail, but we were we were kind of expecting to do a little bit more trail running. We had never been out there before, and uh, we ended up running into multiple spots where the trail kind of just like disappears off the embankment, or like a landslide has just kind of come through and uh, and washed the trail out. But I mean, it was completely epic. Like we went up Crawford Path all the way up the Southern Prezies, went down to Lake of the Clouds Hut, and then uh, went down Monroe and followed Dry River. Uh, all the way back out to the trailhead, but it was it was a pretty epic day. Yeah, see, it's it's nice to be young. I'm getting old, so the <laughs> listeners can't tell, but you you two are both young. It's it's you got young legs, and you can probably. But I, I try to avoid the elevation now. So like I for trail running, like I think about like I like going in the, the Hancock's. That's a nice run for me because it's just you can bust out three three four miles, and then you do have to do that one up. But for the most part, it's it's pretty gradual. So I like that whole area there. Uh, Lincoln Woods is always good for me. It's nice and flat. Um, but I haven't been doing as much trail running lately. I've been sticking more to the roads. But I am gonna. I th- am thinking about doing the the Pleasant Mountain race. So I'll let you know if I sign up. 
Yeah, absolutely. We'd love to have you at the at the race, Mike. Um, yeah. Also, yeah. also, I don't. I, you know, I don't know if I should plug this here, but uh, we also want to offer the listeners, sort of anyone that listens to the podcast, a nice little five dollar discount. So if you use code all lowercase slasher s l a s r twenty four, yeah, I mean, feel free to use that code. You can get five dollars off the Pleasant Mountain Race. Awesome. All right, we'll include that in the the show notes, and um, you know we're looking forward to it. I mean, you reached out, and I immediately was like, "Yeah, this is right in my wheelhouse." Like, I'm I'm trying to convince my wife. I'm like, "Let's move up to this area here," but we'll see someday. But I I love Western Maine. It's where I spent most of my you know time growing up, and I've spent the last 25 years in Brownfield on on the weekends. So anything I can do to get the message out, and and you know, this sounds like a great. Um, opportunity to do some cool races and support um, the, the Loon Echo Land Trust. Thank you very much. Have a great night. All right, stop. Oh, so excellent. All right, you gonna run I those races? I honestly have not heard the segment yet. I'm not. I'm, I cannot tell a lie. So I'm gonna hear it when I edit it. Yep. I'll have to get back to you on it. <laughs> See, I was gonna, I was ready to go right into the line and be like, "So, stop! Do you think you're gonna run the race?" And you were supposed to play along like you had heard it. I just recorded it last night, so we're a little under the gun. So, <laughs> well, tell me about it. How was it? It was, it was great. I mean, the. Um, you know, there's a, I, a lot of com- a lot, I have a lot in common with them just because I I'm, I love that area and um, Pleasant Mountain is a is a is like my home hiking area. So I think that they're really passionate about it. And I'm, I'm going to try to do one of these races for sure. And if I can't do the race, maybe I'll try to just throw in for a volunteer. But that's they did say they need volunteers. So I think if yeah. anyone's around um, during those races, you know, there's one coming up on September 7th and then another on October 5th in Pleasant Mountain. Uh, definitely reach out to them. And I'll include all the details in the show notes and on our social. Slasher's Hiking Topic of the Week. All right, Stomp. So you pulled together, I, I, I kidded a little bit about me doing all the work, but you did pull together a cool little segment here about mm. lost person strategy. I feel like we've talked about this before. We talked a little bit about like that missing case of the young man in, on Mount Katahdin like years and years ago in the 19. 19- 30s we talked about like a book that that had covered some strategies but you've got you've got something you wanted to do a like a deep dive on right so i have the book this is uh from jack daly who sent it to me so he's been on the show before jack daly yep uh, who is active with civil air patrol and it's the book lost person behavior a search and rescue guide on where to look for land air and water I've been planning on doing uh, some segments on this for quite some time, but it's sort of, sort of an overwhelming book. It's um, it's it's heavy on strategy, which I don't think the listeners would get much out of at the moment. But as I was looking through it, I did find a chapter, which I think will be great to just cover briefly, and it's called Lost Person Strategy. So this basically covers what do people typically do, whether they work or they don't work, when they're lost on trail. So... There are 10 things we'll talk about briefly here, and uh, just chime in, Mike, uh, because I, I'm sure you've experienced some of these. I certainly have. And then at the end, we'll talk about what the best thing to do is, according to this. Um, a lot of this data was put together by a bunch of cases out of Nova Scotia, uh, generally involving 120 deer hunters. So they have a whole bunch of data um, to work with. So the first situation, if, if you're lost and you, you just lost your way on trail, the first strategy that may be uh, employed here is called random traveling. And this is when you're totally confused and usually experiencing high emotional arousal. The lost person moves around randomly following the path of least resistance, which with no apparent purpose other than to find something or someplace that looks familiar. Sound familiar? Oh, Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so that's your random traveling. Route traveling is the strategy where a lost person decides to travel on some trail, path, or drainage, or other travel aid, uh, but the route's unknown to the person, and they're uncertain as to where it's going to take them, uh, but they hope eventually that it'll, it'll come out to something familiar. All okay. Right? Mm-hmm. That's route traveling. The third is called direction traveling. Certain that safety lies in one particular direction, a lost person moves cross-country, often ignoring trails 
in paths leading in the wrong, quote-unquote, wrong direction. Sometimes, in fact, this person will cross railroad tracks, power lines, etc., uh, <laughs> convinced that they're heading in the right direction. Unfortunately, this generally doesn't work out too well. So that's direction traveling. Uh, route sampling would be when uh, you have a traveler that's uh, using an intersection of trails um, and traveling some distance down each of those trails to find something familiar. That's pretty standard, right? Mm -hmm. After sampling a particular route without success, they come back and try the other one until something works out. Uh, We move on to direction sampling, which is similar to route sampling, except that the lost person doesn't have the advantage provided by the intersection. Rather, the subject selects some identifiable landmark as a base, such as a large tree outcropping, and from there they go in selected directions, always keeping the base in view, uh, which is interesting. Um, View enhancing, I think we've heard of quite a bit in the White Mountains. This may be where, uh, actually, this it's more familiar to us as uh, the podcast for situations where somebody's been injured and their partner goes up to the ridge line mm-hmm. to get signal. But in this case, if you're lost, you're going up to a higher elevation to get a view of familiar landmarks or topography to set you in the right direction again. So that's view enhancing. Yep. Um, backtracking. That I mean that generally tends to work. So this is when somebody gets turned around, the person reverses track and attempts to follow the exact route back out of the woods. It can be effective. Um, It does take some skill and patience. Unfortunately, lost people seem reluctant to reverse their direction of travel without good reason, statistically. Uh, Just a couple more here. So we have folk wisdom. This would be, you know, just all all water leads to civilization. That may not always be the case. Mm-hmm. So, folk wisdom is a strategy that's often uh, employed. Uh, yeah, I always think about that. Like, people. okay, let's let's follow the drainage, but the, you ended up following the drainage that goes down the north side of the mountain, and then yeah. civilization. Or, you know, now you're in the middle of northern Maine. That's what happened to the kid that got or the young the the issue in Baxter back in the 1940s yeah. or 30s when the, that person got lost. Or you may end up in like a bug-infested swamp. Mm -hmm. I mean, you just don't know 100% of the time. Uh, The recommended course of action, according to this book, is staying put. So most uh, safety programs stress the importance of staying where you are. Um, It's somewhat passive strategy for reorientation. As long as the lost person can reasonably expect that a search is being organized for them, that's probably the best course of action statistically, according to this data. Uh, is typically the case, yeah. And then there's doing nothing, which is a subcategory of staying put, but doing nothing is generally applied to people with, say, dementia that just stop walking oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. and just sit down. Uh, so it's very interesting. So, to, to, I mean, honestly, to summarize it, there is a chart here that I can't really explain too well, but it goes left to right from what works to what doesn't work. And, um, you know, you have direction sampling, staying put, um, root sampling, things of that nature, finding shelter as things that work. And what definitely does not work would be uh, actually surprisingly view enhancing, doing nothing, cross country, wandering, and discarding your gear. That's interesting. Yeah, yeah. we do see a fair amount of that yeah. discarding of gear uh, as well. Like, you know, every once right. in a while you'll hear a story about, oh, I stumbled upon this backpack or, or other random gear. I mean, I've actually stumbled upon multiple backpacks. Yeah, it's very interesting, but that was the most uh, dangerous with the most, the highest percentage of dead on arrival, um, you know, body recoveries, people that got lost and discarded their gear. That is an absolute no-no. Yeah, yeah. I think, too, yeah. a couple things that I think of here that aren't on this particular list, and it could, I don't know when that book was written, but the advice you want to think about as well is marking your, and I know you don't want to rely on cell phones and whatnot, but you do want to mark your um, your your cell connectivity. All right, where did I have cell connection? Where did I lose it in that can be important because you may be faced with making the decision on whether or not like, okay, do I go up towards the summit so that I can get connectivity to call for help? Or do I have to go back towards the trailhead to make that decision? Matter of fact, we were faced with that issue when I had that hypothermia issue on Mount Carrigan. I sort of, I was like, well, I know about a mile up the trail and Signal Ridge will get a signal. Is that better than going all the way out to uh, to Sawyer River? So I do think marking your connectivity when you can 
I know we like to stay off devices when we're in the in the wilderness, but it is worth it to mark your connectivity, um, just so that you you can make a quick decision if you're if you run into a situation where you need help. Yeah, that's a great point. Yeah. So there you go. So I will uh, do some more digging into this book because it's fascinating. There there are other chapters such as this one right here: Lost Person Myths and Legends. For instance, do people that are right-handed veer to the right <laughs> or to the left if they're left-handed? So it's, there's a lot of neat stuff in this book, and we'll definitely uh, touch upon it again in the future. Yeah. By, by the way, Stomp, at being a left-handed person, I just want to give a yeah. shout-out to my fellow lefties because Tuesday was left-handed, International Left-Handed Day. I didn't know you were lefty. I'm a lefty, too. You are? Wow. Yes. Look at that, Stomp. Swear to God. I didn't know that. That's weird. Yeah. Well... Welcome. I think it would be like five percent of the population, ten percent of the population, or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm a little bit ambidextrous, but primarily left. Cheers to you, my lefty friend. Cheers. Never forget. Two, two weirdos. Right. On a exactly. <laughs> okay. Um, so, Stomp. Um, we talked about early in the show that you're you're wearing a sweatshirt, so you're not hot. But generally, this time of the year, you would be kind of sweaty, right? <laughs> right. <laughs> I'm always sweaty, but thank God there's a solution. Oh, wow. What a segue. Yeah, isn't it nice? Yes. So, uh, does your backpack not provide enough ventilation? Does your back sweat too much when backpacking? As you know, sweat can be extremely uncomfortable on the trails. Plus, sweat is a serious risk factor in both hot and cold climates. As your clothes get wet, your core temperature can dramatically fluctuate resulting in hypothermia, heat exhaustion, and dehydration. Let's not forget just very uncomfortable. Today's your lucky day because we have good news for you here at Slasher. There's a piece of gear that solves the sweat and ventilation problem, making your backpack more comfortable. Vaucluse Gear's Ultralight Backpack Ventilation Frame. It weighs 15... uh, Oh, I'm sorry. It weighs less than 3 ounces, which is equivalent to a pair of socks, and it's an accessory that attaches to your pack size, 15 liters to 45 liters. Whether hiking in hot or cold temps, the ultralight backpack ventilation frame from Vaucluse Gear is a real game changer regarding airflow and ventilation. So visit them at vaucluesegear.com to order an ultralight ventilation frame today and use promo code SLASHER, S-L-A-S-R, to enjoy a $5 discount and let them know that Mike and Stop sent you. Now is the part of the show where we do recent search and risk. I feel like this is going to be a world record long show for us tonight, but that's okay. <laughs> yeah, it's all good. So yeah, it's getting busy again. Yeah, yeah we have six, six to go through here. So I gotta. I usually don't tally up all the data and the search and rescues until the end of the year, but maybe I'll do it a little early this year to see how we're trending. But this first one okay. brings us to Middle Moat Mountain, and this one is a beast. I was reading this one earlier. So Thursday, August 1st at 11 a.m., um, Fishing Games notified of a hiker that was injured on the Moat Mountain Trail in Middle Moat Mountain. So they're in the middle of, uh, they're in between North and South, which is, it doesn't look like it's that big of a deal to go from South Moat to North Moat, but it's I think it's probably about a mile and a half, two miles to get in between so um 44 year old hiker from kennebunk maine injured there was she was hiking with a friend slipped and injured her ankle on wet rock and she was unable to bear weight on the injured foot she made a little bit of progress by crawling along the trail um, towards the direction of rescue so kudos to her uh, but the f- fishing game got the call, so conservation officers, along with Bartlett Jackson Ambulance and Lakes Region Search and Rescue, Forest Service, and Mountain Rescue Service responded. Uh, rescues were able to use a gated Forest Service road to gain a more direct route. So I feel like, I feel like on the south moat, 
trail, like there's some service roads or or fire roads or something like that. So they maybe they were maybe they were able to get in from that direction, but they they also I I don't really know. There's definitely some fire roads around that area, so they were able to get in. uh, But unfortunately, the the hiker was like three miles away from the access point, and the way that they brought her out, rescuers had to create a harness system to assist her through some steep, rocky terrain, and she was able to negotiate it with assistance from Mountain Rescue. They had to rig up lines along the steeper sections of rock, and ultimately, they did get her in a litter to be lowered down, and she was carried the remaining distance out to an ambulance. So she got to the ambulance at like 7.30. So 11 a.m., the call came in, and she was at 7.30, she made it to the ambulance. So this is a long day for everybody 7 30 p.m 7 30 p.m yeah so that's like okay. eight and a half hours because she was way way away from like that's as far away as you can get on the moats okay so yeah i'm not too familiar yeah hey, you wow. haven't you haven't hiked over there no oh, no man we not yet get you i know there. they look great oh we have to get you up there you'll love it yeah yeah okay. yeah i can i can agree with that one what i've seen yep yeah, um, and then this next wow. one is falling water. So again, this is a slip and fall, serious injury. Um, it's the on, spot. This it's is the spot. famous spot. 150-foot section of trails accounts for many of the injuries that occur on falling waters. So at 4 o'clock Friday, August 2nd, conservation officers found out there was an injured hiker. Uh, they slipped on the wet, slippery ledge, falling 10 feet and suffering serious injuries. So Pemi Valley Search and Rescue Conservation Officers heading up there. And Good Samaritans had rendered aid until the first rescue was arrived. So 4 o'clock, the call came in. Rescues get there at 540. Injured hiker was secured into a rescue litter with the carryout commencing at 6 p.m., uh, rescue team covered the one mile of trail in a little over an hour and arrived at the trailhead at 7 10 p.m. So, um, 42 year old hiker from Quebec. Um, mm. And he was thankful for the passing hikers who helped, called for help and rendered aid. So, um, yeah. Yeah, that's it. And they say at the bottom here, a large portion of Falling Waters Trail parallels Dry Brook. Dry Brook is anything but dry with much of the trail running along the edge of Dry Brook and several water crossings that are often slippery. So proper footwear. Have we ever like really defined that one spot? Because if this podcast can do anything, it's probably to really pinpoint that one spot. Well, I'm, so ass- above, I'm assuming above- it's like above Cloudland Falls, right? It is. You, it's there's two final crossings. You cross above Cloudland. You cross over to the right. If you're ascending Falling Waters, yeah, you're crossing over the water to the right. You 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 climb up this section, which is the ten foot drop that this person likely slipped off of, and then from there you you cross the final crossing to the left, back on trail, and that's the top of this whole stretch. So it's that one section, particularly if you're descending just below what would be the top water crossing, that's where people are slipping. They're gaining velocity on this green slippery moss and flying off the rock at speed and then falling 10 to 15 feet and crushing their spine, their head. It is the worst area and you have to be you have to be aware of it because you can, if you're not, uh, you could end up like any any of these people very, very easily. Yeah. Uh, I mean, when, when you look at the- a bad the, spot. When you look at the terrain too, to me, like, and I don't know, I haven't looked at the, I haven't looked at the plans at this point, but it seems to me at like 1.9 miles, 2,400 feet. Oh no, I, actually at the 2,400 foot mark, it seems like you could easily just break away and just start doing switchbacks and then reconnect up above Cloudland Falls, which is what I suspect that they're going to be able to do there. So, um, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, it's just, it never ends. But it'll be interesting when they reroute it, what the impact is on search and rescue numbers, because I was assuming they'll go down. Uh, yeah, I hope so. It's yeah. a, such a sketchy area. Okay. Um, so, oh, good stuff. Next up was Saturday, August 5th, I believe. Uh, one eleven fifteen fishing game was notified of an injured hiker on the Mount Eisenhower Loop Trail. 
uh, about three miles from the Edwin Edmonds Path Trailhead parking lot. So I think the Mount Eisenhower Loop Trail is essentially like the part of the trail that connects to Edmonds Path, and as you're going up to the summit, so you again you're pretty far in. So yeah. officials say a 57 year old hiker from Weston, Florida, was descending from Mount Eisenhower when he slipped on rocks and suffered a lower leg injury. Uh, the party attempted to treat the injury, but the hiker could not bear any weight, so they called 911. Androscoggin Valley Search and Rescue and PEMISAR responded to the call. The rescuers went up Edmonds Path, placed Silver. Oh, they're going to go all the way down Edmonds Path in a, in a litter. That's a, They placed the hiker in a rescue litter and carried him down the trail, arriving at 725. So again, the call came in at 1115. And he didn't get back to the trailhead till seven twenty-five. That is another long day. <laughs> oh, yeah, it sure is. Brutal. Yeah, the good news about that is Edmonds is fairly gentle. After about three thousand feet, you know, you can put the wheel on. The yeah, but it's and not gentle. Bounce him down. That other fifteen hundred feet in between oh, yeah. is not not easy. Oh no! Yeah, no question you got about side it. Side hill, it's you brutal. got steepness, you got water crossing. So good luck. Yeah. mm Hmm. <laughs> Well, all's well that ends well. That's a long, another long one. Um, and then I'll care. I'll I'll save this one for the end here. So, uh, uh, Sunday, August eleventh, twenty twenty four. Conservation officers were notified by the um, AMC Carter Notch Hot crew of an injured hiker. So the hiker, 39-year-old hiker from Nottingham, New Hampshire, had slipped while crossing a small brook. And uh, because of the slip and fall, the hiker sustained lower leg injury. At the time, she was hiking the Wildcat Ridge Trail in the vicinity of Carter Notch. So probably coming down, it's, it's pretty steep there. So with assistance of her hiking companions and the AMC staff, they were able to get to the Carter Notch hut. They gave first aid, and she was able to spend the night at the hut. So hopefully in the morning that she'd be able to bear weight on it, but that wasn't going to happen. So um, AMC crew called... At 8.30, 10 a.m., five conservation officers and 24 volunteers from the AMC and Androscoggin Valley Search and Rescue Team responded, and they got to the hiker around 11.45 and um, got her out around 4 p.m., so that's a long two-day hike, or long two days to be out on the trail, and she was able to get transported from the scene by hiking companions to get medical attention. And she was an experienced hiker, well-prepared, proper gear and equipment. All right. Um, This next one stop is Mount Monadnock. This was a trail Mm -hmm. bike crash on August 13th. This this isn't even a hiking... What are you doing here, Stomp? Well, why are they on trails? (laughs) That's true. Oh, wait, no, there's a hiker, too, here. So... um, (laughs) Oh, I remember this one. Yeah, it's a combined story. So the first part part is the hike. Oh, got it, got it, got it. All right. So so basically, this first one's August 13th at 4.30 p.m. Um, There was a hiker that was identified as a minor. They had an eight-foot fall landing on their head, and they had other serious injuries. So the state park... Ranger, or the, the Monadnock Park Rangers responded to the White Cross Trail and were able to stabilize the victim. Serious injuries incurred from the fall, so um, a whole team of some Good Samaritans and conservation officers, Upper Valley Wilderness Response Team, were able to carry the victim to an ambulance. And 4.30, the call came in. They got him to the ambulance at 8, and the, the victim was transported to UMass Memorial um, Medical Center in Worcester. So that's serious. The next article is about some kid that wiped out on a bike and we're not going to cover that. Yeah. Um, I just want to circle back to that because when I was on Welch Dickey the other day, um, I did see three mountain bikers biking, uh, hiking up with their bikes on their shoulders. They were planning on coming down the Dickey Trail. So what is the current regulation for that? I don't know. Remember, we saw we saw them coming down too when we did that hike with, with my friend Jay. They were... 
they were ripping down the um, the ledges. I don't know. I saw somebody coming down South Baldface as well. I don't know what the yeah. rules are. I, f- I, di- I did find one of the guys on Instagram, and people were asking, and it seems to me like that there are areas where they're, they're allowed to ride their bikes. Okay. Must be easy to find, but uh, uh, let's yeah. circle back on that one. I feel like I looked it up one time, Snop, and it was as clear as yeah. mud. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so if anybody knows or anybody has an opinion, reach out to us for sure. All right, so, cool. Uh, and then this next one stop is a uh, hiker fatality on Kinsman Ridge Trail. So heard about this one. This happened on August 6th. Uh, always a tough story. So um, Fish and Games notified of a hiker that was having a medical emergency between the summits of North and South Peak. Again, this is way out there. Um, tough spot. So medical emergency between North and South Peak, four miles from the nearest trailhead. Very difficult to get a response team out there. Um, Due to the severities here, New Hampshire Army National Guard was called to see if they could assist. Uh, In addition to the Black Hawk request, AMC staff, which is a little bit close to that Lonesome Lake, they were able to respond with medical equipment and uh, eventually conservation officers and Pemi Valley Search and Rescue were able to respond. Medics from the Army uh, National Guard Black Hawk team were able to reach the distressed hiker at 3.55, so not bad. 2.15, the call comes in. The, the the Army National Guard team is there before 4 o'clock, and they continued life-saving measures that the family members and other Good Samaritan hikers had started until they were able to transport the, um, the, the victim to a waiting ambulance from Littleton Rescue and Fire. Unfortunately, the hiker su- succumbed to his medical um, emergency. A uh, 52-year-old hiker from Topsfield, Mass., was hiking with his family. So rough story all around. Stop. I mean, there's really... It's just a tough, tough spot to be in, and you just never know. But my advice to people, especially I'm 52 years old, stop. You're even older than I am and frailer than I am. But, um, <laughs> but, but I, my advice to people is like, don't skip your your medical physicals. Make sure that you're talking to your doctor about um, cardiology, fitness, and getting those tests and getting those life scans and things like that because you never know what. I, I don't know if this was a heart attack or whatnot, but it just makes me think like. If you're an older 50-something man, you should definitely get checked out for that stuff. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, 100% agree. So, Can I, uh, circle, Circling back, first glance about mountain biking, it looks mm-hmm. like it's okay, except for wilderness areas. Yeah, I think so, too. Wild. Yeah. There, yeah, it, it looks like it's okay. I mean, there's some basic things like don't, don't cut switchbacks, don't create hill climbs, you know, know the etiquette for people they ascending. Uh, wild. Yeah. Interesting. Wow. I don't know how I feel about that. Yeah. All right. Well, why don't you take the next two <laughs> weeks to think about it, and then we'll be back on August 30th uh, with, a, with a new, cool, awesome episode. <laughs> Sounds good. Very good. Over and out. Thank you for listening. If you enjoyed the show, you can subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Podbean, YouTube, or wherever you listen to podcasts. If you want to learn more about the topics covered in today's show, please check out the show notes and safety information at slasherpodcast.com. That's S-L-A-S-R podcast.com. You can also follow the show on Facebook and Instagram. We hope you'll join us next week for another great show. Until then, on behalf of Mike and Stomp, get out there and crush some mega peaks. Now covered in scratches, blisters, and bug bites, Chris Staff wanted to complete his most challenging day hike ever. Fish and game officers say the hiker from Florida activated an emergency beacon yesterday morning. He was hiking along the Appalachian Trail when the weather started to get worse. Officials say the snow was piled up to three feet in some spots, and there was a wind chill of minus one degree. And there's three words to describe this race. Do we all know what they are? Lieutenant James Nealon, New Hampshire Fishing Games. Lieutenant, thanks for being with us today. Thanks for having me. What are some-
some of the most common mistakes you see people make when they're heading out on the trails to hike here in New Hampshire? It seems to me the most common is being unprepared. And I think if they just simply visited uh, hikesafe.com and got a list of the 10 essential items and had those in their packs, they probably would have no need to ever call us at all. 